Okay, Mr. Malcolm, we have, we have kept you waiting for quite a long time. So I know your, your submission is one of the more comprehensive ones that we've received. So I'm going to ask you now to begin your presentation and just indicate who is with you, Mr. Malcolm, or if you're going to do it alone. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm joined today by Matthew McNaughton, principal of Slash Roots Foundation, and this coalition of 13 organizations is co-convened by Slash Roots and Jamaicans for Justice. Matthew will take us through the first bits of, of our submission and our opening statements, but I just wanted to underscore that our intention here um, is to see aspects of the bill improved, and we're very grateful for the chance to speak, and we hope that our words are received in that spirit of constructivity. Um, over to you, Matthew. Awesome. Um, thank you very much, Roger. Um, Thank you very much, Chair, for um, facilitating our participation. Just give me a moment while I present. Are you all seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Awesome. All right. So as, as Roger mentioned, this is a, a broader group of actors, um, civil society, private sector, um, as well as members of industry who kind of come together to prepare this, this submission and prevent, present a diversity of perspectives on this. Um, I also want to, you know, in starting, I want to say, you know, um, very much acknowledge the, the work of the chair of the project team. I have watched almost all of the joint select committee sessions and the, the town halls, usually on 1.5 speed on YouTube. Um, but you guys have sat through them in their full extent. Um, and I think, you know, the, the public doesn't necessarily always appreciate that, but um, very much thank you for, for the work so that you so guys you, are doing. You, you will agree, Matthew, that we have been educating the public as much as we can. I mean, yeah, given the, given the, given the circumstances, I know that has, that has been the intention um, uh, of the- Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I wanna kind of start before we, we jump in by just um, you know, reiterating what Roger mentioned. I mean, this coalition in its entirety and unequivocally supports the establishment of a national ID system. Um, what we've tried to do um, you know, we all recognize the inconvenience of the of the current identification framework in Jamaica. Everybody has, every, all of us experience that. When you go to the when you go to the bank, when you try to register our children in in schools, um, when people try to access social benefits, there are too many Jamaicans that do not have access to an ID. Um, those statistics have been shared on multiple occasions, um, and we all agree that we can do better as a society. I think where we really have tried to focus with our submission, um, Chair, is that the other side of the, the, the reality of what we're trying to do, which is that a national ID systems and approaches such as the ones that are put forward by the government um, also have risks. You know, there are risks in how they collect information, how that is stored, how that data may be shared by others. And they're also made more complicated by the pace of change in technology and the way that technology is transforming our society. And so some of the risks that may not be necessarily possible today, but may be possible in the immediate future based on those changes. Um, and so what we've done is we've looked at the bill um, and you know, we've looked at the bill, not for just what it will do today and what it enables today, but what it may enable in the future and also how other actors may seek to, to, to use it. Um, and what we'll, in looking at that bill and looking at the law and the letter of the law, um, what we'll ask is that we really, you know, there are a number of things that the NIDS project team, the, the, the chair have said, well, this is not how NERA will operate, or this is not our intention for how NERA will operate. But the practice in five or 10 or 15 years is that the the, the burden of examination is going to fall on the letter of the law. And so in specific cases, we have to make sure that the letter of the law reflects the intention and the spirit of the team and, and, and the government. So I'm gonna just hand over to Roger to just start with our general observations. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so we will go very quickly here. Many of these points have been said before. Um, the first is that significant components of the legal framework are to come in future regulations. Um, these include 
how application for enrollment work, how authentication will be managed, what transactional data will be created and how it will be shared, how verification will exist, accredited par third parties, you name it, there's a regulation that is to come for it. It's because of the far long reach as a public defender says that this law has. And so we're asking for three things um, in relation to the regulations that we think will help improve the process. One, just like the bill, we're asking that the government commit to publishing the draft regulations ahead of their consideration in Parliament and allow for some public input, even if not in this type of setting. Um, this happened last time with our regulations working group, and it was we were on that working group, and it was quite helpful um, to improve the regulations as it as they went through. The second is that um, there was a stated intention in previous times that the regulations will be coming before the act is actually passed. And so we expect and are, and are urging that Parliament and the wider society receive the draft regulations as a measure of good faith and transparency prior to the passage of the act, given that the manner in which the act will be operationalized really requires an understanding of those regulations. And then third, separate from the regulations, um, many of the partners in our, in our coalition who work in industry have really emphasized the need for this and we agree that the government, the NIDS project team publishes technical and operational documents um, white papers and, and other specifications that will explain how the processes in NIDS will function at a more operational and technical level because of the strong technological implications. Watching these joint select committees, there's oftentimes a lack of a common understanding about the technical architecture being um, enforced and thus people having different recommendations based on that limited common understanding. We think that would be something moving forward that would be quite useful that could come from the technical team. Um, second, I won't spend too much time on the Data Protection Act. I think it's very clear that we need this. I'll just indicate, however, that an interpretation of this bill is difficult and in many respects incomplete without the Data Protection Act's regulations in place. But the Data Protection Act itself articulates largely just broad standards and the nitty gritty of the protection practices are to be specified in its own regulations. And so it's very difficult to understand the nitty gritty implications of many of the components of the bill. And so with that, in, with, that, with that not in place, it constrains just the breadth and the futuristic thinking that we can do in these, in these sessions. Um, yeah, and, and then third and final, a point that we made many times that the government has agreed to, is that for now and in the future, um, while it is voluntary, administrative or operational decisions shouldn't have the intention or the effect of having people experience it as mandatory, whether it is access certain goods or services, or it is promoted as a preferred identity choice within government. We just want to underscore that, that very important point as a general observation. So we move on now to some foundation principles. Um, and our submission goes into detail into several of these. Uh, we'll only focus really on, on one of the first foundation principles, which is the integration of the respect for human rights in the acts, objects, and in the authorities' operations. Now, we make three recommendations here. I'm only focusing on one. You have the others to read. And it is to affirm that access to the rights to legal identification is a core purpose of the NIDS bill. It's not really a contentious point. So far, we've been saying it over and over. The purpose of the bill is to provide persons with greater access to legal identification. However, that's actually not stated in the bill um, in a clear and direct way. Um, and we think that's important to where there are matters of interpretation or there in the future, or there's concerns about if something goes beyond the objects and the reasons of the bill. And as a test of what to measure the actions against the objects, it's important that we state it very, very clearly. The government's white paper tabling the NITS policy in parliament explains in its very first paragraphs that Jamaicans lack basic legal identity documents and therefore they face social exclusion. The NIDS policy itself opens the statement identity as a human right. And so we just think it's sensible to include that as a core tenet of the bill explicitly in the objects. And so we're recommending that section three be amended to include that as an object. We've given a language here to facilitate access to legal identification. We have two other recommendations, which I won't go into, but it's just to say that we think that both in sections three and sections five, there should be explicit reference to um, adherence to human rights and fundamental freedoms of all persons um, in a free and democratic society, whether as a new object or integrated it within another object, as well as in the functions and powers of the authority. We find that particularly important given the human rights concerns that have been raised relating to the bill and the previous court judgment, and we can't see any opposition to including as an object and a function 
that human rights will be respected in the same way that there is an inclusion that data protection rights will be respected and data security rights will be respected. We think fundamental rights and freedoms are so intricate to what is being experienced with NIDS that that too can also be accorded um, consideration in the objects of the act and in the functions of the authority. Now, turn on to Matthew. Roger, Roger, just why would we want to put that in? It's a part of the Constitution of Jamaica. Yes, so, Minister, there are many things that are part of the Constitution, but we think it's useful in clarifying both the purpose and the constraints um, in specific language and the authority, but also to make it abundantly clear that the spirit that the spirit of the bill, the spirit of the law, ought to accord with French oh broadly. But minister, it, it it is just for your consideration. I, 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 so I think what I'm really saying is that are more important. Do, any law must be observed and respect human rights and fundamental freedom, rights and freedom. So it would be superfluous to, to repeat it in a bill that must conform with the constitution. Certainly, Minister, if that's your view, I understand. Um, that would be generally the state of society. It would be much better if that was done, but that's, that's not the case. But I would just say, if that were true, then you wouldn't mention any need to respect data protection because you have a Data Protection Act. And so there is use in specifying things for emphasis and for clarity, but also for constraints. But we can, we can, we can agree to disagree no, 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 on that. No, I one. take the point. I just yes. play devil's advocate here. I mean, that's all right. Okay, so I'm going to move on to Matthew, who will speak about the um, the identity information being collected at contentious point. We propose a solution that we hope will strike the balance that everybody is seeking to strike on what we collect as identity information. Over to you, Matthew. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, thank you, Chair. So, you know, multiple presenters have already raised this issue of the scope of the data that's collected um, by the authority. Um, we've heard the responses of the project team. Um, we don't want to re regurgitate a number of those issues, but we also think that there are some more nuanced um, points that need to be discussed by this joint select committee. And so I just want to raise those as a start, and then we'll go into the discussion. One, that the bill grants the authority discretionary powers to deny an individual access to legal identification based on the information that they provide. And that information may ne not necessarily be necessary for fulfilling the primary purpose of the bill, which is access to legal identification. I'll show where that is in a moment. Um, two, that the bill itself is internally consistent, inconsistent rather, with the principles of um, data protection best practices, because it's collecting information that are, is not necessary. Um, we take note of the additional use cases that the, the chair and the project team have mentioned around compliance with um, know your customer information, but that's an extra use case on top of the primary function, which is legal identification. Um, and then third, that you know, it's the bill itself, and I know the persons have mentioned that the information in 11.1 says that the authority may collect this information. But the bill also in section 10 creates an obligation on the individual that is when they're enrolling to provide all of the information and not providing that information in a way that provides a material objection to the authority is an offense. And so we have to be careful about the balance between both of those things, but we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a moment. So, one, um, you know, this is all of the information that the authority, um, that the, the, the Joint Select Committee is proposing be collected. Um, we take note, like the other submissions, that this is less information than that was um, highlighted or proposed in the first version of NIDS. Um, but we still would say that this information um, is extensive and, 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 and still too much. Um, in fact, we think that even the breadth of this information departs from the government's own policy position on this. Um, and I think we need to, we will propose that the, the chair and the Joint Select Committee review that information. Two, um, 11.2, um, which I think was created with the intention of facilitating um, the, 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 the authority to enroll persons where information may not be provided, but it can also be read, be read as the authority having discretionary powers to not enroll persons where they feel that information 
is not sufficient. Um, because there's no definition of sufficiency or insufficiency, it really opens up um, a, a, a um, you know, the ability for the authority to deny legal identification to someone um, for not providing specific information, such as their employment or their name of their spouse, which is really not identification inf identity information, and thus deny them access to legal identification. We actually propose um, very clearly that that information that is mandatory um, for, for enrollment be much more narrowly defined and much more clearly defined in the bill. And that really should be limited to the core information that the government's policy position states that is necessary for um, providing legal identification. We think that this is the only information that really should be mandated for collection and only information on which the individual may be denied enrollment for providing um, uh, or, or collecting information on this. I want to make a note here, Chair, that this does not prohibit the authority from collecting additional information for the purposes of verification, which is captured in section 12, but in terms of what information is retained on the individual and what information the authority may ultimately um, deny enrollment to an individual on that basis, it should really be very narrow and should be clearly defined and should not be open to discretion of the authority or a worker in the authority um, who could threaten an individual um, the opportunity to be enrolled in the system based on their, their personal discretion. Um, I think some of this, these points have been raised already. Um, we see you know, the government's policy paper that was to inform this bill, which was published earlier um, in April 2020, ahead of the red bill, the public the tabling of the bill, talks about really the importance of minimum information being retained and that only the information being collected should be that which is necessary for, fulling, for fully fulling the purpose of the law, which again, we see as providing legal identification to all Jamaicans. The second thing is that that bill also establishes, you know, the, in the biographical information that it, at the time that the government believed was necessary to perform that function. Um, full name, date of birth, address, uh, marital status. Um, but not only that, but that it, there was a principle of security by design that was articulated that collecting this minimum amount of information was both in the best interest of the individual but also of the system and collecting and retaining that breadth of information that is being proposed actually is a security risk, raises a security risk of the, of the authority and the national databases because it means that a individual with um, poor intentions would only have to target one, in, one agency to be able to collect or to access all of the information that they're seeking to get. So there are a number of reasons why retaining only a minimum amount of information is a good um, principle. And then lastly, the idea of data minimization, um, which is that only the information that is relevant to performing a particular function is something that we've enshrined in our Data Protection Act. And so, you know, we see that the mandatory collection of this information, which the authority is empowered to require of individuals, um, should be, you know, should be looked at um, and that the specific information that is ultimately collected should really align with that core, core principle of what is required for doing legal identification. Um, we need to do such as streamlining the process of opening bank accounts and a number of other things that can be collected, that can be collected as optional information and make it very clear to the individual that here is the kind of benefits that this additional information is collected um, would bring to you. But ultimately the core information that is mandated or could be mandated by the authority should be very clear and should be very narrow in its articulation. Um, and then lastly, and I think this is very important to one of the points that we're gonna make next is that the bill also, also obligates the individual to provide information, all of the information 
um, that may be required of them and creates an offense in relation to that information. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about two very, three scenarios where we'll, I think we think we highlight the concern that this may raise and where individuals might be opening themselves up to um, offenses um, as a result of that. So we're going to start with James. And so we've built out a number of these scenarios to kind of illustrate the risks in the bill, um, as well as clarifying like, well, what does that look like um, for, you know, the average Jamaican person? So James lives in Balaclava, St. Elizabeth, um, but he's come to Kingston to go to UAE. Um, he wants to register for NIS ID because he wants to qualify for summer work program. And when he completed the enrollment application, he only listed his town address because James thought that it would look better on his job applications in cases where that information needed to be um, disclosed. According to this bill, James could be a charge with an offense because he did not list his grandmother's address and his address in Balaclavo. The, the offense, as you are, the, the chair is already, and the, the project team is aware, um, could, be a could result in a fine up to $3 million for not including both of those addresses. But that's not misinformation, that's just an omission. You're right. He, We're gonna come have... Yes, but he would have been misleading the authority in relation to that information, which is how the offense is created. No, but anyway, continue. continue. Mm -hmm. So the second one, which goes to the point that you're raising, Chair, um, Mavis recently unemployed for work. Um, she's looking to the passport that she previously used as an ID has expired, and she wants to register for a needs card now. Um, she doesn't want unemployed to be associated with her identity. So she writes that she's a domestic worker, um, but she hasn't, which is the last job that she worked before the COVID lockdown last year. Um, according to the bill, similar to what we've discussed before, this kind of omission, um, based on what's been provided, could be interpreted as, um, you know, as being as, as activating the offense before the authority, because she has been dishonest about her employment status, and therefore she could be subject to a similar fine. Um, and then the last one, which I think touches on a, a different kind of issue, is in the case of um, an individual who is eligible to enroll in NIDS based on being ordinarily resident in Jamaica. And this one would really have a question to the joint, um, to the joint select committee to answer. So Catherine recently moved to Jamaica um, for a job with an international organization. She's been accompanied by her partner, Sarah. They're both registering for NIDS cards as individuals who are ordinarily resident in Jamaica. The bill makes two things possible in this scenario. One, Catherine and Sarah could enroll and list each other as their spouses, or Catherine and Sarah could write that they're single and therefore mislead the authority committing an offense before the law. I think what we're trying to understand is in a scenario such as this, what should the, what should the couple do in this case where they have, for example, been married in another jurisdiction and are now enrolling and their status has to be, um, they have to indicate this information. And so we kind of close this part of the section with you know, two questions um, that we think are Im important for the Joint Select Committee to, co to consider. I think one is relation to the, the principles around the scope um, and the principles around um, the information that is being collected for the enrollment process. What was the rationale for departing from the, from the policy paper? I think that's an important one to, to, dis to discuss. The second one is whether the, 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 it is the position of the government or the joint select committee members that the authority should be empowered to deny individuals access to legal identification based on a failure or an unwillingness to provide identity information that's actually unnecessary to establishing that legal identity. And so I think those are two questions that we want to, to raise for discussion on this first position, um, this issue. Um, we actually have recommendations for addressing these scenarios. Um, we think that, that the, the bill or what we've proposed in our position that the identity information itself be modified to, to, to only require the information that's necessary for providing legal identification, which is much more narrow than the information that's currently stipulated there. 
Um, we allow the alert authority to collect optional information, but we clearly highlight that that information is optional. Um, we amend the bill um, and, the, and the, uh, to clarify the authority's discretion on the 11.2 to clearly state that once individual provides sufficient information to establish that identity, the authority cannot deny their enrollment. Um, and lastly, we suggest that the authority provide value added verification services for optional non-essential identity information that can enable new service delivery models or conveniences for the public um, on this position. This is, I guess, a re re repeat of the information that we're proposing for, for the core information that's collected and retained um, by the authority. Position three, um, requiring the full operation of the DPA. Um, this has been raised by multiple persons already as well. So we're not going to spend um, a lot of time um, talking through all of the issues here. I think the point that we'd like to raise on this is we're seeking to get greater clarification from the Joint Select Committee and from the government around operationalization. Um, we see operationalization as including three things. One, the bill, which has been mentioned by a number of persons, needs to be brought into force um, by gazetting on the appointed day that the government um, decides to do that. Two, that the Office of the Information Commissioner needs to be established um, and uh, as part of that operationalization. And then three, that the necessary regulations of the DPA that outline the data protection framework be actually put into practice and those, those regulations be published and operationalized. The other thing that has not been raised yet by any of the other um, submissions thus far, Chair, is the reality that you know, the Data Protection Act itself includes a two-year transition period for which all data controllers in Jamaica do not have to comply with any of its provisions um, or its regulations. Um, this is captured in section 1.1, which we have on the screen, and section 76, um, subsections 1 and 2, which state that full compliance with the act um, is, um, is not necessary before the expiration of two years from the earliest date appointed under section 1.1, which is when the bill is, um, the act has been gazetted, and that in section, subsection two, no proceedings under the act may be taken against any data controller in respect to the processing of the personal data um, done in good faith during that period. And so, you know, we've, there have been multiple kind of deferrals to the idea that the Data Protection Act will address this or will you know, we will comply with this, but the authority could be operating for two years or more and not have to comply, you know, could be in compliance with the Data Protection Act, but that compliance in effect is non-required non at that period in time. And so that has two, that raises two potential scenarios that I think it's important to highlight the risks um, for, the, for, the, for the Joint Select Committee. So just to kind of think forward, we're, we're now in April 2022. The government is now six months into the operations of the NERO. The NERO becomes aware that one of the third party data processes that it's used for digitizing the biometric data has a security flaw in it that may have been potentially exposing this data. In this context, the Data Protection Act, where the Data Protection Act has not been fully operationalized and applicable to the activities of the NERO, the government is under, and the, and the NERA are under no obligation to communicate this information to the public or to the individuals whose data may have been exposed. Um, and I don't say this to, 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 to create alarm. I think it's just a, it's the reality of the, the, the context that is created by the sequencing. Um, we've obviously just went through a very unfortunate situation with the JAM COVID application um, where information was exposed. Um, individuals really would not have become aware of that um, had it not been from it being covered by the, the press or a particular journalist. Um, and we think that it's the importance of transparency um, for something as important as NIDS. Um, we'd want to see that kind of um, transparency and, and honesty incorporated into some kind of legal obligation. 
the other scenario is a little bit different. So it relates to how people's information will be treated by the authority. So again, we're, we're, we're in the future. Um, James is one of the early adopters of NIDS. He's recently used his NIDS card to access a loan. You know, everything's going well. During the process, the bank requested consent from James for his identity information in Nero to be disclosed to them, which is provided under section 24.1. James consents to this, um, no worries there. But later, based on a later communication from the bank, James becomes suspicious that the bank is using his data in a way that was not what they initially communicated. But, but Matthew, Matthew, before you go in there, mm -hmm. data will not be revealed by the Nero to anyone. That's All not that what section 24 Authentication wants. of the data. No. In other words, mm -hmm. what would happen is that the bank would have been, the, the NERA would not be releasing information in, to the bank. The NERA would only authenticate that this person is who he says he is. But if the bank says, ask the, is this person date of birth or is this person um uh date of birth so and so the 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 uh, I will say yes or you know something like this but if yeah. they ask the Nero can you mm -hmm. give me the date of birth of this person then Nero will say no we're not giving you any data you can ask a verification not Chair, the data. We'll, we'll Chair, we're going to be talking about disclosure in detail. So 20, section 24 one. So that is separate. That's different. When the commission of police asks for it. No, Chair, that's that section 24 C and 24 2. 24 one A specifically says that an uh, individual may consent to their information being disclosed by the authority. All right, so, continue. Yes, yes, Chair. Um, so Again, so I mean, and and and, and the, the project team has spoken to this in, in, in part, right? So James logs into the Nero interface, whatever that may be, to confirm that his data has been disclosed. He would be able to see this information um, based on the, what the NIDS project team have shared in previous sessions. Um, so he would be able to confirm what information has been dis disclosed to the bank. Um, and then he reaches out to the bank to request clarity on how that data is being used. The bank does not respond. Without the DPA, it is legal for accredited third parties to change how they are using, processing information that has been shared with them after the fact. Um, without the Data Protection Act operationalized, James has limited recourse. He can make a request for clarification from the bank, but they are under no obligation to share, to respond to him in this regard. And the information commissioner, if appointed, would also not have any mechanism through which to project to protect the interests of James or any other individuals because none of the data controllers themselves would be subject to the provisions under um, the Data Protection Act. Is, is, is this James' fault huh? in that he, he consent to that information which he himself could have given the, um, the bank? True, it, it is. It is it, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily fault per se, but I think the point that we're saying is that what the authority is going to be doing, and this is kind of like a function of the technology, it's going to significantly decrease the friction by which information can be shared or verified by any other third party individuals. And so we have to engage with the concept of the authority within that framework. Um, okay. Yeah. But if I could, if I could also, Minister, yes, what Matthew said is one part of the answer, but I don't think it's James's fault. Because if we take the scenario where there's a two-year transition period, you know, or we take the scenario where we don't have a Data Protection Act in place, any of those scenarios, James would have enrolled, given his information, there is some disclosure permitted under Section 24, and he then finds out, whether it's because of the two-year transition period or the fact that that DPA is, in, is, in, is at pass and not in force, that he does not have the standards of protection that he ought to have, that we legislated that he should have, but they aren't applicable to this scenario, either for the next two years or because the act hasn't been brought into force. And that is largely going to be the expectation that many Jamaicans have when they enroll. They've been told it is fully secure. They've been told there's a data protection act. They've been told 
your data is going to be, and there's redress for you. But when you parse down through the circumstances, how the DPA would either affect or not affect the situation, James is going to be left in the dark. And so Matthew has some questions further that will help clarify this, but particularly this, the, the, uh, the sequencing of the operationalization, not just bringing it into force, but the appointment of the information commissioner and the regulations have to deal with that. And for somehow parliament will resolve the two year transition period because a million persons could be enrolled in two years and a lot can happen in two years in James's situation and many others. And it's something we would need to find a solution for um, before selling it to the public that the DPA is going to be applicable. We're hoping we can find that um, together. So if, 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 we, if we agree that the Data Protection Act applies to the NERA, from inception, would that solve the problems? It would solve a good number of the problems, um, and it would address this particular scenario of James, which oh, involves right. yes, involves several other stuff. And make that as a proposal, then that's the the, the, the DPA. Yeah, man, it's like one DPA. slide down. Huh? One more slide. Matthew is gonna Matthew is gonna make that. Okay, through that no problem. Go ahead. Yeah, man. No, man. No, man. And, and I'm glad you're with us, Chair, because I think that's precisely where 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 we'd okay, like no to problem. go. Um, so, one, I think the question that is raised here is, you know, what are the in the case during that two year transitionary transition period, what are the legal enforceable obligations on the Nero or the government if there is some kind of security breach that affects the identity information of individuals enrolled in Nero? And secondly, what, are, what redress will individuals have if they believe the data that they have is improperly used by accredited third parties? Um, I think we broadly have a, a question from the coalition regarding the current stat, status or the drafting of the regulations for the Data Protection Act. We think that's an important and germane point that should be update that should be provided to the public. Um, as it is central to the operationalization of the DPA and NIDS. And also, lastly, given that the NIDS project team has publicly stated the objective to operationalize the NERO sufficiently to have the capacity to issue, to issue cards by September of this year, how are they configuring the system for data processing without knowing the requirements to be included in the Data Protection Act's regulation? Um, I think that's a, a third point that we think should be um, the joint select committee should be asking of the project team as well. I, I can't I can't tell you exactly where the regulations are because to be frank, I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's obvious to us, and we have said it, that for the near or the needs to come into operation, based on the judgment in the 2017 legislation, the judgment of the, the um, full court. It's clear that the Data Protection Act has to be in operation before the, the needs come into operation. So I just, mm -hmm. I, there's no doubt in my mind that that is one of the preconditions mm -hmm. that for the needs to come into operation, that the Data Protection Act should be in operation. That's my understanding anyway. Sure, sure. No, and, and we very much agree with that. Um, the last point is really that there are certain implementation decisions procurement of systems and, and that sort of thing that are envisioned, that have started or are maybe envisioned to happen over the next few months, subjects, I mean, subsequent to the passing of the bill that could happen before the regulations have been published. And so that's a broader concern that we have that that work may be happening even though the bill itself has not been operationalized. So we obviously have a certain, you know, to the point that you raised, um, Chair, that section one of the bill be amended to require that the effective date be a date after that of the date that the Data Protection Act has come into force. Um, this would prevent the bill from being brought into force without the promised data protection provisions being enforceable by the law. Um, so this would go in section one of the NERA bill. But then also that provisions be introduced, whether to the NERA bill itself or to the Data Protection Act, that remove the Data Protection Act's two-year period of the exemption from being applicable to the authority. This would ensure that the, all the data protection provisions are a fully enforceable on the authority from the moment that it commences operations under the bill. Um, we are, and then this, this last recommendation is really how we see operationalization of the Data Protection Act, which we mentioned before, gazetting, 
Office of Information Commissioner being established and that the Data Protection Act's regulation being um, uh, published and completed. I'm going to hand back now to Rajre to talk disclosure. Great. All right, so Minister, so this is position four. Thank you very much, Matthew. So we've had a lot of discussion around this thorny section 24. Um, what does what data can be disclosed, what cannot be disclosed? A while ago, uh, Minister, you, you had interjected saying that NERA is not going to be sharing any information with anybody. It is only authentication. If they want to know, the bank may send a request, is this addressed five Black Road? And the NERA may say yes, and it will be no change of information. That's simply not the case under Section 24. But I want to really clarify why that confusion may occur. So there is disclosure, which is under Section 24, which has three options. Um, the one that you consent to, the one that the police apply for, and one under any other law. And then there is the authentication and verification, which does not include the disclosure of any identity information. This is not about that right now. This is not about the match, no match, or the yes, no, or no, any non-disclosure. This is about a transfer, a disclosure of information that otherwise would be shielded, which you expect to be totally confidential. So the first is that data sharing is fully possible. Um, oh, thank you, Matthew. So section 24, just to read it in full, um, there are three types of disclosure. Um, first, 24 says that you should not disclose information, which is a very important provision, um, except under three circumstances. 24.1a says in accordance with a request of the individual concerned subject to a fee, which means that I can request that you disclose my information and I should pay you to do so. That's what 24.1a says. 24.1b says when the judge pursuant to the application from the commissioner of police allows for the disclosure, which we've heard quite a lot of back and forth about. And the third, quite vague, is the authority can disclose identity information any amount that it wants to, as may be otherwise prescribed by this act or any other law. That's the open door. So there are the three types of disclosure. To make it abundantly clear, this does include the revelation of someone's otherwise confidential and secret information. And therefore, it is the area you have to pay the most attention to because it is the greatest, one of the greatest risks here, because otherwise nothing would be disclosed. So how we configure the parameters around this is very, very important. And we think it's unfortunately um, a little vague in areas and areas where we could do a lot more to, press, to specify. So back to the first slide, a slide above that, Matthew. Um, so there are three broad concerns to start, and we're asking for the, the bill to strengthen the parameters and safeguards for disclosure of information to third parties. The so section 24 doesn't really have many provisions that explain what disclosure could or could not look like in practice. Just our disagreement a while ago about what it would look like when the bank requests it reveals the need to specify what it can and can't look like. It does it need to regulate the format and the method that regulations can do, but it should set some broad parameters. Secondly, the open-ended power created by Section 24.1c, which is the power to disclose to anybody under any other law, um, without some transparent process that further specifies how that should work, or some oversight body like the court, like we have for police, is a concern for us. And third, Section 24 only prevents the disclosure of identity information, um, but this actually allows for the disclosure potentially of other information, including authentication records or logs, which Matthew will get to afterwards, and transactional data, which in the future, if the NITS card is adopted quite rapidly with electronic access, could reveal quite a lot about pattern of life, which Mona Law raised last week. With the omission or the restriction of Section 24's disclosure provisions, just the identity information, which may have been an oversight, um, would not accord that other information, which is just as sensitive in some respects, um, protection of 24. So explaining this a bit, um, data sharing is possible. I have to make sure that's very clear. Last week, this was indicated when Ms. Facey gave one of her responses, um, and she indicated that the law needs to allow for data sharing within restrictions. Um, it's just that those restrictions aren't in the bill. Um, moreover, it's, it was indicated that that data sharing is largely just to keep things smooth and operational. But with the situation we have at Section 24, there really isn't, there aren't much provisions that would explain what that data sharing could look like. So I'll explain that in a bit. So two slides down, Matthew. We think that clear parameters could be established that could explain how disclosure can lawfully occur. 
that includes the forms it can and cannot take, um, how the process can and cannot be managed, and how recipients of disclosed information ought to be managed, just like the children's advocate also suggested in the, in the context of police. So since we have recognized that disclosure can occur, will the law allow for the authority to transfer records, actual records um, from the database to third parties? Um, will they get a file with the person's information under Section 24? We know that's not your intention, but 24 gives you the power to disclose in all of these three circumstances. Um, that file could be copied and shared. Will it be a portal that they have to log into? We don't know. The bill says that identity information should be encrypted and kept illegible. But if you're going to disclose it, will you not have to decrypt it and make it legible? How will the authority manage this without a specific power to do that in the bill? This is what we speak about when we say we need to actually specify broad parameters and powers for how disclosure would occur, given that it is going to occur under Section 24 in three possible ways beyond just the police, only one of which require a court. And so that's very important. Similarly, how the authority is going to manage the third parties who receive this information is also critical. Now, the response keeps on coming that, well, when those third parties get it, whether they be the police or a bank or somebody else under any other law, which we know is vague, um, they, will be, they will be under the control of the Data Protection Act. There isn't really any issue. Well, that, that doesn't really respond to the core issue. One, the consent that someone provided for was with the authority, not with the third party. Um, second, all of the Data Protection Act's provisions for the most part are ex post facto. So you find out when something goes wrong, but there's no, apart from 24.1a where you consent to it, when you disclose in a 24.1b or c, there is no notification to the enrolled individual. So I wouldn't know that some other party, whether the police or some other party who gets it on the C, has it. And therefore, there isn't much of a real redress applicable under the Data Protection Act, nor is there under Section 30. Section 30 creates an offense if someone is not confidential, but the issue is not if there is insufficient liability in criminal, in current criminal law, but the issue is whether or not protections have been put hardwired in the bill that would prevent disclosure, not punish disclosure if it occurs. And so taken together, there is a need to provide greater specificity around how disclosure will occur. Quite frankly, the section in 24 is really just one paragraph. The rest of 24 deals with the police going before the court, but this much broader power to disclose what should be kept secret needs a lot more treatment in the bill. And so we have a few questions um, on the Section 24 that we think are pertinent. One, um, we would love to know from an operational perspective so that maybe it could then go into the bill, um, the mechanism by which identity information will be shared with third parties in Section 24, given that Section 24 allows for this open-ended sharing with third parties. Second, will the intention be to decrypt those records since they have to be encrypted uh, to facilitate disclosure and will we put something in the bill to facilitate that? Um, so that is internally consistent. Um, how does the NIDS project team intend to operationalize Section 24.1c within a technical architecture of NIDS? Again, this is the ability to disclose to anybody under any other law. You know, what does that look like? Do they make a request? Do they, does it, does it work like a third party? We're not clear what that looks like. Does that include private actors and public actors? Number four, will public sector organizations via Section 24.1c be able to access aggregate or batch enrolled individual data. So can disclosures and multiple persons go out at once? Does it have to be individualized? 24.1c is a very, very open door that we have to really put some walls around if you need to understand how it will function, particularly in the future. And oh, future yeah. thinking, so, yeah. So, so Ron Jane, Ron yes, Jane, suppose we, suppose we said that um, section 24.1a, b, and c, or should I put it differently? That C should be in accordance with with V. You know, in other words, any authentication or access by anyone would have to be done in accordance with um, you know Section Three, that which applies to the Commission of Police. That's so exactly what we're recommending, Minister. So you're saying that if 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 any information to be accessed under this act or by any other law, it should be in accordance with the same provision in subsection three. You would, you would agree with that? We would. So Matthew, next slide. That's exactly our recommendation. Okay. We're recommending that section 24 be amended to require that any disclosure of an enrolled individual's information that they didn't request 
only occur when ordered by the courts. And the provisions under, sub, under subsection 3 that deal with the application process and the factors to consider would be applicable, but we don't think it needs to always be an ex parte application um, as it relates to 24.1c. But the bottom line is that the court, as a judicial actor, ought to be involved in the disclosures under 24.1c. The only space that we could see that, that that not being the case is if the other and some other statutes under which 24.1c is being invoked um, includes that procedure already. Um, but we don't see the authority being able to just decide on its own, um, regardless of the Interpretation Act or not, that it will disclose my information and not tell me to some unknown actor under future laws. So we think we're, we're in alignment there, uh, Minister, as a, as a way that this could happen. And, 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 you know, I support that position in a way, because it's too open-ended. But you will agree with me that if we agree with you on this, it is inconsistent with your position and restricting the the items for identification to only the seven points you mentioned. Because what I mean, what, why those seven those seven points no. and in the date of birth, um, et cetera. No, in other words, no, in other words, I can see I can see where, for instance, for any additional information that anyone would want. I mean, the, what you mentioned, full name, date of birth, sex, nationality, and the biometric facial, if those are so, if you limit them to all of those seven items, there's so, no need to get them. So, well, first of all, Minister, we're not proposing an exclusion of the other items, you know. What we're saying is that those items which are actually necessary for identification should be right. the only things that NIRA can Require so remember the bill. In order to register, yes. Remember the bill. The, the, the NIRA can collect anything it wants to collect, and right. once people so, voluntarily give it, but so only not, those seven you're, attributes. But yes. you're, not, you're not objecting, like the public defender, to the collection of a host, a trove of other data, including the twenty-one listed in section eleven. If people want to voluntarily give that information and it is not a condition for their access to an ID, we have no issue with it. I want no, to be very clear. And, 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 and to be fair, as the AG pointed out, it was just a menu from which they, they, they could, the they NIRA could select in order mm. to ensure the uniqueness of the individual. Yes, and no, Minister. So let me say the point a different way because here is the issue. Section, the, the, the bill says you can you may collect all this information, right? It's a long, large suite, right? Not all of it is necessary for identification. Some of it is just value-added stuff. My occupation, you don't need that. You know, my other addresses, my spouse name, you don't need that. But it's additional stuff that the project team has said is useful for know your customer um, stuff, which is an auxiliary secondary function. However, in 11.2, the bill then says, as Matthew pointed out, the authority effectively has the discretion to determine what it requires for enrollment. And with that discretion, it could then require every single one of them, or it could require things that are not strictly and rationally connected to the purpose of giving identification. So what we have said is that allow the authority to collect all of these parameters it wants to collect, but it cannot make those things are the ones that we have recommended mandatory for enrollment. So someone okay. like me who only wants to give my fingerprint and my name and those required things can still access the ID because I'm one of the one million. And the authority can say, do you want to tell me your spouse's name? Do you want to give me your second and third addresses? Do you want to give me your occupation? And I may say no and still get my ID because I've given the information. The authority shouldn't be able to deny me. Somebody else may say, yes, government, take all my information. I want to be able to do these KYC things. I only bank online. And the authority can still take that. What the law doesn't strike right now in its language is communicating that it is simply a menu. What it communicates is a menu and a broader power to require any of them that the, that the authority wants. And we are recommending that some constraints be carved out only allow the authority to require for identification those things necessary for identification. Uh, I, I, thank you. I understand you better now. Uh -huh. okay, okay. Thank you. I'm very happy that we are, we are understanding each other. Um, and so 
we need to have time and move on a little bit since we have since you've agreed on section 24 and the court um at least at least from your perspective i won't bother to go to the example um matthew and so with another another point here now is um still under section 24 um is that the bill does not restrict the authority from disclosing other information about an individual that the authority holds such as the records or logs of authentication or verification requests or other transactional data um, instead of prohibiting disclosure of information, uh, it actually only prohibits disclosure of identity information. So again, just look on section 24. Um, if I could get that on the screen, section 24. Um, it's bolded there. It, the, the section 24 only really applies to identity information. And so what Matthew will get to this shortly afterwards, but as was considered in the last joint select committee session and previous others, there is transactional data. We don't know what transactional data is not in the bill. Nobody has given us what it is. But there's transactional data that is going to be generated during the course of, during the court life cycle of NIDS, hypothetically. And at a minimum, the bill establishes that the authority is supposed to keep a record of every single authentication um, request um, and verification request. So there's data that is potentially sent um, that would not be caught under the remit of Section 24. And so what we are proposing um, in this respect um, is that that Section 24 be amended to apply to all, ident all information held um, by the authority and not just identity information. And we think that would be particularly useful. And just to remind that Section 1 indicates Section 2, sorry, indicates that authentication is a process by which you prove a national ID card to be true or to be true. So it's to verify that it's a real thing. And then Section 25 says that the authority is to cut, maintain records of each authentication. It's also supposed to maintain records of each verification. Again, the bill doesn't specify what this looks like, what data is collected like it does for identity information. But if we hypothesize what the bill would enable 10 years down the line, it could look like someone being able to scan their ID card, authenticating it somewhere, even if that's not the technology you're going to roll out in September, authenticating it somewhere, a record being created, someone using their ID number to that online transaction, it being authenticated in some way, and a record being created, and records being created that are actually revelatory of person's patterns of life. That is a feature of enrolling in needs. We're not saying that cannot occur. However, the parameters that restrict disclosure and protect our information need to also apply to that information. And so in this regard, we have four recommendations under Section 24. One, and we've agreed on two of them already, it seems. One is to amend Section 24 to create clear parameters for the method of disclosure. These parameters can explain how disclosures can occur and cannot occur and the actual forms it can and cannot take, how the process will be managed and how third parties are to be managed. That is important. The DPA is not a panacea in this respect. It also applies the same standards to a cook shop, JPS, Digital and NERA. Obviously, NERA has to have a different standard. That's why we're doing a separate bill for it. Section, uh, second, our second amendment that we're proposing here is to amend section 24 to establish safeguards on the use, processing and storage of information by third parties to whom information has been disclosed, including the police. And this is in line with the recommendation that Children Advocate made earlier. Third is to amend Section 24.1c, as we've just agreed, Minister, to require that the disclosure of a person's information that they did not request only occur when ordered by the court. Um, it would probably be sensible to then establish a little bit of guidance to the court in that respect, because I don't think it needs to always be ex parte. Um, and four, amend Section 24 to ref I mean, Section 24 is reference to any information. Um, I mean, Section 24, sorry, to reference any information, not only identity information, and clarify that the prohibition on disclosure is not limited to just identity information, but extends to all information held by the authority about them. And so I want to also note in these recommendations that there is also a need to put limitations on what kind of data is going to be shared across platforms through any automated process. Um, again, it has been suggested in the responses at times of the projects team, um, and certainly the responses that came to us in writing, which we're very grateful for, um, that there is 
an intention to have some minimal data sharing opportunities available um, to, to the authority um, under Section 24 or otherwise. And so clarifying what type of data could be shared and what automated processes are acceptable is a concern for us um, because in the future where these processes could be fully automated, they may run the risk of being experienced in a manner that persons who enrolled didn't think they would have been experienced. And I particularly think that transactional data here is very important. The response that we got, um, you know, either in writing and from the, the response of the project team was that the only purpose that the transactional data would be retained and used um, is for persons to access their own transactional data, and that it wouldn't be used for any other purpose. But that's not in the law. Um, it's not in the bill anywhere. It's not in what the authority is required to tell the person when they enroll. Um, and so without that, those statements are very welcome, but the power may be wide open to use that data for other purposes. And we've made recommendations further down about restricting the use of that data. And the response that we got from the project team was that those restrictions would be unwelcome because the authority should be able um, to process and, and limitedly disclose um, that data. So we'd be really careful to understand in what way the data is going to be used. Um, so, and finally, and then so moving on now um, to transparency in the disclosure process, this is very simple. Our position five is to establish a right to know of disclosure um, under section 24, unless it's shielded by the court. I know that there's an understanding that you will be notified when there is disclosure. The bill does not say that. The bill says that you have a right to know of authentication verification requests, which does not include disclosure. The bill, as you've said earlier, permits disclosure of personal information under Section 24, but does not give us the right to know what disclosures have taken place, when and to whom, even in circumstances where I myself requested a disclosure. And so we think this may have just been an oversight because, again, we've written a right to know under authentication. The DPA has a general right to know how your data is being processed. So we expect that this is also the intention here, but it's just not there. And so we're suggesting that the right to know about disclosures ought to exist in all circumstances, both consented and unconsented, unless a court circumstance says that this should be shielded. And this is the case of the police. We're obviously, if, if it is something that is sensitive and the, and, and the person ought not know because the court has determined that the facts suggest that it's a security risk, then obviously that right should that right would not be extended there. But we believe that there should be a presumption of transparency for all disclosures, 24.1a, 24.1b, and 24.1c. And, the circ and that presumption should only be overridden by some other competing interest, the burden of which is on the state to prove. And so we think that that would also help improve the transparency in the bill. It would also help the bill reflect the commitments that have been perpetually given um, by the project team and by the spokespersons of NIDS, which we, are, which we agree with the principle. It's just not in the bill. And we think that putting it in the bill could significantly improve the coherence of the language with the stated policy intention. But and you're so- just, You're just asking for tweaking of um, the positions. A tweeting no, so that- we're... Not tweaking, it's not there at all. It needs to be I added. Know, I know. So you just want to ensure that there's transparency in terms of the disclosure. Yes, and that our right to disclosure exists under Section 24. Okay. And that no is a right that be established, just as there is under Section 25. Okay. Okay. So that's our first recommendation. It's on the screen. Establish a right to disclosure. Our second is to require notification of a request for disclosure um, prior to making that disclosure and allow re a reasonable period of response unless the court limits that disclosure based on some compelling interest. Again, this gets back to what the public defender and yourself were um, were going, and the attorney general, sorry, were going back and forth about, and, and the question that she wanted to know when would someone know, um, and that kind of stuff. We think if we establish notification as a provision of Section 24, limited only in circumstances where there's a compelling interest, then that really addresses the concern of the authority potentially disclosing something about someone that they didn't, that they don't want or that they didn't consent to, or where they have a valid reason to contest the disclosure that is, un that is unconsented. This particularly applies to Section 24.1c as well, because um, we don't believe that that should be totally ex parte. Um, and a third is to require a quarterly transparency report. We think that's a good practice um, that would summarize um, in aggregate form the disclosure of information 
that says how many requests came in, um, how were they managed, and whether they were um, whether they were granted or not granted. It's important for us, transparency wise, to know the trends of the authorities' disclosure of information. We suspect that would be something that we'd do anyway for their board and the author and for the inspectorate. We think it's a good practice for the public as well. No um, so we're going to switch gears here from section 24 to section 25. And so I'm going to hand over to Matthew to deal with the issues to do with authentication and verification. Awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, all right. So authentication, I mean, we've already kind of alluded to this. A number of other presenters have highlighted this, um, but we think that it remains unaddressed. Um, so just as a just a point of reference, 25, section 25.4, so it says that the authority shall retain for some period a request, a, rec a record of each request for authentication or verification under this section. Um, it's important to note that it doesn't necessarily treat with section 24, um, which tells about disclosure, but our broad point about authentication requests. Um, as we discussed before, Section 24 doesn't treat with that information at all. Um, but 25.4 does establish that the authority will be retaining a record of this information. Um, and so while the collection of authentication records is not the intended primary objective of the authority, I think the scope and security of this data actually possesses the biggest risk to the security and privacy of the individual within the context of enrollment in NIDS. Um, while biometric data represents the identity of the individual and that generally does not change, the authentication logs themselves capture how the individual lives their life, where they, where, which doctor they visited, where, the, where they bank, when they ordered food using the new NIDS, I mean, end system. All of these things will be services that potentially in the future could leverage Nero for identity verification purposes. And so the bill really doesn't really treat for how this information is protected. Um, and we think that that must be added to, um, there must be added stipulations for how that information is managed and what processing can be done. The reality is that this data set's value will increase over time as more services integrate with NIDS and the historical record for an individual is grows. And so the transactional data will become valuable to many different kinds of actors, to banks, to the police, to private sector, to researchers, and the temptation to use it and to seek it out will expand over time. And it's also important to keep in mind that the potential breach of this data is, is a significant privacy risk to that individual. Um, I think most of us will probably recall recently the, in you know, a few years ago, the issue with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica um, with that platform. And what that really revealed to the, to the world is how little behavioral data is needed to be able to manipulate the public in a variety of ways. And this authentication data set is, effect, is effectively that information that the NERA will be collecting and retaining on its citizens, on the Jamaican citizens. And so without proper legal barriers put in place, we do put ourselves and potential future generations at significant risks with the advantage of technology and the adoption of nearby other services. So we're gonna talk about that, what that looks like in practice for a couple individuals. So we're in a future state. Again, the NERA does not put any stipulations around the processing of this information. So scenario nine really talks to the police are currently mining the transaction records looking for individuals that match a specific pattern of behavior in target communities. Andrew here is um, frequents once several of those communities and a number of service providers in that area. So that's a scenario that we're talking about. Again, the bill doesn't treat for how this information is governed. Based on Andrew's pattern of behavior, he and several other individuals get flagged as can candidates for additional surveillance at this point, Tim, it's important to make a note, no identity information has yet been disclosed. All the police are doing is processing the logs themselves, which do not necessarily include personally identifiable information in terms of a needs, um, a national ID. Why, why do you think the NERA would be collecting 
this sort of information, the movements of Andrews, um, Andrew, I mean, I, I, I don't see any way. Where in the NERA is it collecting information as to where Andrew goes or comes? 25-4, um, Chair. So in 25-4, what it's saying is that the NERA is going to keep a record of every request for authentication or verification. So just as we were talking about before, this when you do what, a, what, what, I, what, what, I, what, Mm -hmm. This is just a verification of the data. It has not correct share, but let, but here's the point there. So if I go to a if I go to a health authority or a, a clinic, and I show my NIDS card, and that NIDS and authority and, and the, the the service provider for whatever reasons does a verification check on that card or the information that I've been provided, what the NIDS is going to collect is that a authentication log. Our authentication request came from, you know, Balaclava Health Clinic in St. Elizabeth in relation to John Brown. So he would, the, the authority will retain a lame, the, the, the individual or the entity, the aggregated, the, 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 the third party that has requested the verification and whether that information has been disclosed. So, so you're, you're saying that on the section 24, the pol if, if, if the police requests that the individual um, data or authentication, mm -hmm. that 10 banks ask for verification, mm -hmm. that is the sort of information you think that, you know, that the police may want? Potentially. Words, potentially. And, it, the, and here's the issue, you know, in a, in a world where more and more service providers are using NIDS, the NIDS for verification, that data itself approaches near real time on what that individual is doing in their life. So maybe right now where one service integrates with it, it's not a big issue. But in five or 10 years, when, you know, when we are a digital society, which is what we are transitioning to as the prime minister is saying we're moving towards, then potentially almost every service provider that provides digital or online services could be authenticating with the, with the Nero. And so that information itself becomes a bigger and bigger footprint on what the individual is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so you're saying that section 25.4 is um, suspicious or highly dangerous in that it will be well, mapping out the movements of the individual? Well, what we're saying, Chair, is that Section 24.1 establishes that the authority will be collecting that information, but that the bill itself doesn't actually provide any treatment for how that information may be processed, who it may be shared with, and how it ultimately may be um, governed. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to this example, so in this case where we're now looking at the authentication logs for a number of individuals, again, the bill doesn't prohibit this type of processing. Um, the current draft does not war require a warrant or any judicial process for the processing of this data. The police could then, after they've identified that there are certain persons that fall within that pattern of behavior, make a request under section 24 for that identity, for the identity information of the individuals who match the target behavioral pattern to be disclosed with, to them, which would then trigger the, the process that you've identified um, that we've that's specified in the bill. You know, in this case, it's been fully investigated, and it turns out that Andrew was really just visiting his grandmother in that community. But it talks to the idea that this kind of profiling and analysis of this information, the door that it opens. How would you correct it? You're, you would, you would want to say that the record, the authentication must not be recorded or must not be revealed? So, Chair, there are a couple ways that it can be treated. Um, the first one is that it should be stated that this information is personal data, because without a clear definition that it is personal data, um, it may not even necessarily fall under the, the Data Protection Act, as we've been, been talking about before. Um, but then secondly, I think, and which we make this recommendation later, we actually think that the processing of this data should be strictly prohibited, um, and that it should only be prohibited 
in as much as it enables the in enrolled individual to access their own data, but we shouldn't open the door for other third parties, whether in the private sector or in the public sector, to be processing and mining and profiling individuals based on this information. Okay. So the next one is going to be, um, I hope you guys uh, will, be, will be patient, but I think it's an important one given with what we're seeing you know, um, across the world and you know, misinformation campaigns and all that sort of thing. So there's an upcoming election um, that is expected to be close. There are individuals that are between a particular demographic in key communities have been established as gonna be playing a critical role in determining the outcome of the election. The current government, um, not necessarily this government, but the government in power at the time, um, could request from the Nero the transaction logs of all individuals between 30 to 45 to better understand the services that they frequent by this demographic across the multiple constituencies. The impact is that individual, the government could use that information to build a targeted digital and offline strategy and messaging campaign that could shape public perceptions around opposition candidates and the kinds of promises that they would offer if reelected. And so again, we see the ways this kind of behavior data is used to manipulate and undermine democracy elsewhere. And I just, we, we, we raise this scenario to really hit home that this information will exist in the Nero and we need to put protections in place um, around it. The questions on this chair that we think at a, that, that are starting point that need to be addressed um, that the Joint Select Committee should discuss is it should ask of the project team what data will be generated and retained by the authority in performing the identity verification and authentication services. This is not stipulated in the bill. It's not constrained in the bill. And so I think we need to have full transparency around that. Um, the bill also, how that information is stored and protected is gonna be really critical. What processing of that data, the authority or the government is that is gonna be possible. I think that's absolutely critical for me to be um, transparent around and to stipulate in the bill because in the future, without that stipulation, other parties may seek to use it for additional purposes. And then whether this information can be sold by the NERA to accredited third parties or public organizations. Um, and I think the last one, which is really an important one, is that if this information is going to be retained or stored or processed anyway, I think we have to be transparent with the public that enrollment in NIDS could mean, the question that we have here is that if the answer to any of these questions regarding the processing of that data is yes, does the Joint Select Committee or the NIDS team believe that it's the expectation of the public that enrollment in NIDS would mean that their behavioral data would be tracked and processed for other purposes? I don't think this is a current view. I hope that we don't get there, but I think this is a question that the current lack of stipulations around this information does raise um, in regarding to the authentication logs. So we have a whole lot of recommendations on this, um, and I think there could be a very long discussion on this on it. At, oh, at before, the may, may I make a suggestion? Um, um, yes, Chair. And so then the members, I'm going to ask that we, we suspend it now, mm -hmm. and then you'll come back and continue next week from here. Is that, would that be okay? Yes, Chair. But more importantly, you are, you know, you are, you're using a PowerPoint um, presentation. Is there a possibility you could pass it on to the NIDS team so that at least when they respond, you know, they could be more pointed? Absolutely, Chair. Right. So in other words, because I'm seeing, you know, I, I can't say I've gone through what you, the, the paper you sent in great mm -hmm. detail, but much of what you, a fair amount of what you've presented by PowerPoint are additional, you know, points you've made, you know, which is more um, detailed. So what I would do is to ask you if you could send a PowerPoint, you know, mm -hmm. to the NITS team. So when they respond, they could respond more fulsomely. And yes, so sure. what I would do, um, if you don't mind, is invite you back here on Friday at about 10 o'clock, is that possible? Friday of this week? Yeah. Yes, that's when we are concluding all the presentation. Yeah. Yes. yes, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Right?
So we're concluding the presentations on Friday. And I want to thank you because obviously you've gone through this bill in great detail and gave it, given it a lot of consideration. So we're having you for a third time on Friday. <laughs> and so, I mean, I must admit today has been an excellent session where both the public defender, the children's advocate and yourself have brought up some very interesting points that need further consideration. So that what I will do is to ask members of the Joint Select Committee to agree with me that we suspend your presentation and you continue to finish it up on Friday morning. And we have three other short presentations on Friday to conclude all the presentations. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Mathieu and Roger, and hope to see you on Friday at 10 o'clock. Yes, Chair. Thank right. you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Committee, I hope you agree with me. And can I have a motion for adjournment? So moved, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. And thanks everyone for being with us. I thought we decided to close off now because um, the recommendation being made by the Jamaicans for Justice representing the other 12 organizations from what the, the contribution, the written contribution are quite extensive. And I thought it was best to start afresh to be summarizing their recommendation on Friday for us to better understand and consider it. And also for the needs team to be able to respond more fulsomely on what they've presented so far. So I want to thank all the members of the committee for joining us. It has been a very instructive and informative evening. I hope you all agree. <laughs> So thanks very much, and we're going to um, adjourn now until Friday at 10 o'clock. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good evening. I know everyone um, recovering from the Easter weekend. So am I. So <laughs> we can go and rest some more this afternoon. Thanks now. Okay, evening, Chair. Evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, go ahead. Um, yes. Uh, we wanted to just finish up the presentation you started. Okay, I'll just start, Matthew. Sure, go ahead. Okay, Matthew. thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you for the, the time to, to continue the presentation. Um, and so where we live, we kind of had to stop abruptly on Tuesday. And so for just, I want to set some ground um, as to, again, why we're here. For us, it's not the what, it's the how. Um, and so as it's, as I said time and time again, um, there are many responses that are quite cogent that explain the policy intent, but we don't really see them in the act. And as such, we are really craving a dialogue today um, that provides us with clarity as to the legal footing for many of the reassurances that we that we keep getting, um, either from the statements in discussion or from the policy team. Um, and a comment I wanted to start with on function creep, because it was an important discussion that happened just before we came on, um, which is that one of the ways that we protect against function creep is to conceptualize circumstances of that creep in the distant future even, and determine if the provisions of the law at present are sufficient to constrain that. Um, and we think in our view, the law right now has many opportunities for us to plug those gaps, and that's a lot of what our submission focuses on. Um, Thirdly, um, on Tuesday, um, we explained a way to keep the authorities' ability to collect the menu options of identity information while addressing the concerns about its disproportionate scope. Um, as a reminder, and it in impacts our following point since we have this interruption between us, um, we propose restricting the discretion of the authority to mandate the full menu which it presently has um, and only empower it to mandate if it ever comes to that, that information is strictly required for establishing legal identity. The government themselves proposed only four attributes in April of 2020. Um, and then finally on section 24, which continues to be a thorny issue. And again, it impacts the points coming from Matthew subsequently. Um, so we clarified that, you know, we, we agreed in, in that setting that sharing of data is certainly possible with third parties under section 24 in three particular ways. Um, and what came out of that was 
that we propose that the court be involved in sharing of data under Section 2413, um, Clause 2413, um, with any other parties under any other laws. However, as it, as it, in relation to the, the response chair, um, you indicated that this, today and, yet, and on Tuesday that that would make sense to you and that it would be through a procedure um, just like what would happen with the police. However, while we appreciate the, the, the recognition that the court ought to be involved in those unknown disclosures to under any other law, um, it wouldn't, for us it wouldn't be satisfactory to say it should just be like the police um, for two reasons. One, the procedure specified by the police is quite specific to national security um, and so some of the grounds just wouldn't be applicable. Um, but additionally, that presumes that the applications for that um, are all ex parte. And um, that wouldn't necessarily be optimal or appropriate for the wide range of things that could be disclosed to any other party under any other law, present or future. And so an importation of the procedure for police, which follows in Section 24, um, would, be, would, be, would be reassuring but insufficient to address the, broad, the broader concerns. In addition, we remind that our recommendations in the Section 24, which we won't restate after this, also included the right to establish a general right to know of disclosures under Section 24, unless sheeted by the court, which does not exist right now, though it has been said that it ought to exist. It only exists right now under Section 25 as it relates to authentication. And then a comment on the Data Protection Act. Um, and so we know the point, we've made it many times, it has to come before the, the, the need is imp implemented. We're very clear on that and we're thankful for the, for the concession there. However, we know that there is still concern about the two-year exemption period and we hope to get a, a very specific answer from the NIDS project team or the CPC or from the parliamentarians as to what will be done in respect of the two-year period of non-application of the DPA, even if it were to come into place immediately. Um, and then the DPA is thrown out oftentimes, which is very good law, um, it's thrown out oftentimes as sort of like the generalized response to any privacy concern that comes. And while the DPA does have very important provisions in place, the DPA is a general law that equally applies to a sole business, JPS, flow, a cook shop, a business, a school. Um, and it doesn't always address the unique wants in society concerns that will come from NERA, which will not have a companion entity. So, for example, the, the Data Protection Act um, only requires that one standard, one element of its first standard for data processing be uh, met in order for processing to occur. So hypothetical in the Data Protection Act, um, NERA or any other data controller could process the data, which could include disclosure, analysis, or use, um, to exercise any function under any law, um, to exercise any function of a public nature, um, to pursue its own legitimate interests or its legal obligations, um, or if the minister exempts the data protection standards by an order um, which could apply to whole groups of persons and other categories of persons. And there are many more examples where the DPA, while very good in establishing broad standards, doesn't always plug all the scenarios that the potential of the data set as broad as NIDS could present, and Matthew will explain a few of those shortly. And so we just want to be very clear that when we make recommendations for specific incorporation in this bill to prevent those examples, it's with an understanding of what the DPA already prevents. And so to come back to where we ended on Tuesday, we were speaking about authentication and the need to have greater parameters around the processing and storage of authentication records. And I invite Matthew McNaughton, um, my co-convener of the Civil Society Coalition, to go into that presentation now. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks to the members of the committee for having us back again today. Um, we'll just jump right into it. So um, I won't go through this position um, in its record in its entirety today, because obviously we've covered quite a bit. I think what I'll just highlight here from this is just a few important points. One, just a, a reminder to everyone, authentication is probably one of the most critical features of NIDS. It's the point at which you, myself, any enrolled individual is going to prove their identity to some other third party. So when a third party seeks to verify that identity, the NERA will create a data log. Um, the law obligates the NERA to maintain a record of this information and keep this information on all of the individuals that are enrolled in the authority. With the broader adoption of NIDS, this data will increasingly capture patterns of behavior on enrolled individuals. And our position, in summary, 
is that the bill as drafted and the existing data protection law um, do not contemplate enough protections for this kind of data set. Um, it's going to be fundamentally different and unique data set in the Jamaican context. Um, we've, we have to engage with it and its risks head on as we try to protect ourselves and, and future generations. Um, so we'll just jump directly to the recommendations around this because we've already covered kind of the, the risks and the issues on this. Um, so our recommendations kind of um, start um, at the top. I won't read them out um, for you. I think the, the, the committee has the, the recommendations. I think the first one is that we should establish that the authentication and verification logs, um, uh, generally that there is a prohibition um, against their processing um, and that the information will only be processed in as much as it is necessary to provide enrolled individuals, yourself or myself, with their own information. It's a, I think we, the, the, the project team, others have mentioned the importance of individuals being able to know and control who has access to their information. And I think we want to retain that, but we want to generally put some safeguards and prohibitions on that information being used by many other authorities, whether in the private or public sphere. Um, we should include um, some provisions that require um, the protection of this data um, and similar in similar ways to the ways that we are protecting the identity information. We've already spoken about the ways that this data itself can be, and other um, persons have now mentioned this, that this data can be used in a myriad of very dangerous ways. And so we want to make sure that this data is protected and explicitly obligated on the authority to protect it in a particular way, similar to the ways it referenced the identity information. Um, and you know, I think there's a point that maybe said that, well, what if we anonymize the data um, or pseudonymize the data? Um, I think we would, we would posit, and one of our scenarios touches on this, that even being able to get the anonymous records for this information would allow a kind of profiling and targeting um, you know, manipulation of, 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 of the population, even with just using those are anonymous records. I think that's important to establish clarity, clarification around. Um, there are many recommendations here, so I won't go through all of them. Um, we talked about prohibition from using that information. Um, I think we want to make it clear with our section 25, or rather, and section 24 should be amended to state that this, these records are logs, are the personal data of the enrolled individuals. Um, the reality is that it may be seem obvious, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, one of kind of the, the, the biggest gray areas with data protection globally is whether logs are the personal data of the individuals that generate them based on interactions of services. There are ways in which logs can be stored that do not necessarily reach that threshold of personally identifiable information but still could be used for the purposes that we're talking about before, um, before. So I think we need to include a proactive provision around this um, to, to make it very clear across the board, in addition to some of the other prohibitions on processing. Um, you know, I won't touch on the verification one. Um, the, another, another important one is that on the section 25.4, it states that the authority has the discretion for how long these records are kept. Um, I think we disagree with that. We think that should be something that is given to the individual. If I would like to delete or you know, unenroll, remove my authentication logs, maybe, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, I should have the agency to be able to do that. It shouldn't be the case that I, the authority alone can determine the length or the period for which the data is retained and or processed. Um, others have touched on accredited third parties. Um, we think, I mean, I mean, the other one is around a public register of accredited third parties. That's not in the bill, though I suppose the project team could state that that will be in regulations. Um, and then I think, and then obviously on consent, which um, we won't touch on again um, for, for today. Um, and then I think lastly, I think it's just very important, um, specifically as it relates to this, and this is a point that's been mentioned by multiple members in the, in, our, in the coalition by industry, that it's really critical that the, the, the project team and the government publish 
more technical documentation about how NIDS will function. We've heard from the project team that the business processes have been defined already. Um, we know that some of those implementation decisions are, um, have already been made. Um, but you know, we talk about a number of other ID systems in other jurisdictions. Many of those published extensively white papers, um, flow diagrams, et cetera, about how their identification system was going to work before they even started implementing those things. Um, and I think, you know, to kind of build public confidence, to kind of engage the public and the expertise that exists in the public, in addition to the consultations that the project team has already started, we think these things should exist as public documents um, for industry and other persons to, to do that um, as well. So I'll pause there. And the DPA does have provisions that clearly allow data controllers to um, disclose um, information such as that where exemptions are provided that may be okay in the general sense, but it would not be okay for NIDS. And so in the context here with this scenario, just to come back to it, um, as Matthew indicated, as you use your authentic user, user ID card, especially in the future of the technology advances, data is generated, which includes your behavioral data. And so this scenario that, that is on the screen of the government using a, a potential future government, future political party, using the data um, available to improve public services, to inform election campaigning strategy and messaging um, is a live issue and has been contended with in other in jurisprudence um, externally, as we heard from the previous presenter. Um, and so this, however, is a risk of profiling, but it does not include a disclosure of personally identifiable information. And I want to explain why that's important, because the Data Protection Act specifically allows for this type of information to be processed and disclosed so long as it doesn't personally identify persons. And so the Data Protection Act does not expressly prevent the type of mining of transaction logs, or at least or an interpretation of the Protection Act is that it would not expressly prevent the type of mining of transaction logs to establish profiles for various purposes. And the Data Protection Act also expressly allows that if the purpose for this is research, which could be applied to any purpose, good or bad, then the particular provisions that would deal with disclosure um, would not apply. Mr. Malcolm and Matthew. Yes. Suppose we, the regulations say that the retention period should not be greater than 30 days, would that assist you? It would address the retention point, um, but it wouldn't address... No, but if, no, but if, the, if we put in the regulations, say in respect of 25-4, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the period should not exceed 30 days, or would that, would that um, solve the problem? Um, so I'd want to reflect a little bit on that period of time, but your point is that if you keep a narrow enough window, then it wouldn't present the risk. That's your point, Minister? That's the point. Okay. So I would say that that wouldn't solve the full issue. It would be a very good step. However, I want to recognize that because that data could still be disclosed within a 30-day period and then just analyzed by another actor who is not NERA. Um, because the disclosure would not be prevented. And so if somebody wanted to, to, to do, to, someone wanted to really analyze this data for behavioral mining purposes and to establish profiles, and the only protection was that it wasn't kept for a long time, but there wasn't a prohibition on general processing analysis for profile forming or disclosure, as we have recommended in our many recommendations, then they would simply allow for a process of disclosing that, um, and then some other actor could analyze it. So it doesn't have to be that NERA mines the data and analyzes it, but so long as there is no safeguard against its disclosure or processing for that purpose, it is not very difficult to find crafty ways to process it, and then NERA kind of doesn't have to do it directly, which would be smart for NERA, but not really a protection for the data subject in full. And so that would be part of it. It would be good, but it wouldn't be fully sufficient. For us, obviously, we think what would be fully sufficient is for the, the set of things that we've recommended because we've thought of multiple scenarios and we think that those would close as many of the gaps as we could creatively think about in these scenarios. I'm sure other actors could think of more. And we think those prohibitions are particularly important since there isn't a fallback fully. The Data Protection Act addressed that. One other way to address it would be to establish this broad prohibition and then introduce regulations that would deal with that um, if it is that more time is needed to think about the particular parameters. 
Um, so, yes, so you, uh, there's, you, there's you, a point. Oh, you would okay. favor general prohibition, right? So, in other words, in Section 25, you would want to uh, say a Section 25 eight that says that no information in regards to requests made by any individual, individually or combined, should be released by the NERA. Yes, that would be one thing to include. The other thing to include would be including in the prohibition on disclosure in 24, all information, and putting under 25 that the only lawful purpose for which the authentication verification services can be used is for the establishment of a person's identity. That would make any other purpose tangential to identity services, which is the only reason why it's there, not a lawful use of that. Without that right now, the door is half ajar. And so that's that's what I would call a general prohibition. And then maybe even some of the other stuff that we've asked for could go in regulation so long as that basis is clear. Okay, something to consider. Thank you very much um, for that, Minister. So then moving on now to a very simple point, which is the um, safeguards of the privacy and design of the card. Um, so you know, Section 19.1 enables the authority through regulations to add any information it sees fit to the card. Nothing is wrong generally with the ability to put things on the card. Maybe you want to put a reference number or you change how the logo looks or something like that. But we don't think it's appropriate for the authority to be able to add new identity information. Um, during the January 5th session um, of the Joint Select Committee, um, this project team had indicated that um, it intended to have a partial fingerprint um, on the card, which is not presently in the bill. Um, and so we think that the power to add new identity information to the, to the card should require a revision of the law because what goes on the card really is, is one is critical for privacy, um, but moreover represents effectively what information about the person is meant for public display, like your name, probably, um, but what is not meant for public display, like an address, or even the parish that you enrolled in. Maybe that could it, it, it refrain information that someone may not want. Worse, if a full fingerprint pattern were to be put on the card. Again, not saying that these are the present intentions of the, car, of, of, of the government, um, but this would be possible. A response could be that that inclusion by the authority under Section 19.1 would require an order subject to affirmative resolution. For us, that's not, that's not satisfactory. Um, one, respectfully, we kind of know the process by which these orders get approved in Parliament. There's no real debate or ventilation or public notification. And the public who have enrolled would not really be required to consent to or know that new information is being displayed. To give a quick scenario on this, very simple, I'll just go to scenario B this time, since we're out of time. A future administration may believe it's important to include person's address and occupation on the card because it's important to manage a population. That's somebody in 10 years' time. The authority then uses its power under Section 19 to do this, and nobody is notified, and the public doesn't have to consent to it, though they enroll under different terms. We think an easy fix to this in our recommendation um, is simply to um, remove the ability of the authority to require um, the display of other identity information not already listed in the Act through future regulations. To be clear again, this does not prevent the authority from adding other operational details um, to the card. And we will also suggest that the project team publish technical specifications on the current design options for the card. People are throwing out wild theories out there. Would it include your fingerprint? Would it be chip? We don't know. Would be good to know um, so we understand what we're dealing with. Um, so moving on, um, I hope that point is, is well understood. Um, so we're going to speak about the governance and accountability, and luckily this point was made several times. Um, so we'll only focus on what really matters for us here. So we have indicated, Minister, um, that several times that the, that the Joint Select Committee is reviewing the governance structure um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the of the authority. I want to point out two observations. One, the present governance structure of the authority effectively makes it a regular government entity and the NITS policy said it was supposed to be under the OPM, which allows it effectively like any government body to be moved around the public service, reclassified, restructures, and otherwise have its affairs managed by a changing political directorate. But moreover, Section 7 gives the minister special power to give the board directives that they are required to adhere to. For quick reference, it requires that the minister, give the, in, after consultation with the chairperson, give the board directions of a general policy nature. Um, why is shielding the authority from this type of influence um, useful in managing risk? 
Um, first, respectfully, you know, they're just corruption concerns um, that have affected the highest levels of government. And for something as sensitive as this, we think it would be in the best interest um, to not have those concerns ever be raised as, a, as an issue. But third, uh, second, if the established way is per currently going to be proposed, the authority would be subject to all the things that come with running a regular government entity that's not a commission of parliament, for example, whether it is political appointment and in, in interferences in the regular staff, administrative control, ministerial discretion, and the soft influence that comes from when you don't have an insulated body. So here's an example of this. Um, let's say we are a few years down the line. Um, right now, they are not processing transaction records. Let's say, for example, what we spoke about before doesn't happen, not because the law doesn't present it, prevent it, but it's just not being done. And a private company is interested in getting access to the authentication logs of enrolled individuals um, in the NERA. Um, maybe a banking sector thinks that it should be processed. Um, the authority is not yet processing this data, um, nor is giving access to public or private entities. Um, and the management of the transaction log data is also not addressed in the law or the DPA, so there's nothing preventing it. Only the authority just doesn't do it. The company then approaches the minister with responsibility for NERA and proposes a fresh idea for data processing that could be valuable in their opinion to the government and to the, and to the, and to the economy. And they even give technical advice on how it could be done. Here's the impact here. Without forming a judgment on if that must or must not occur, under Section 27, the minister would be empowered to give the directive to the board that this should be a general policy pursued. We should start processing the transactional data. Just giving this as an example. I know we addressed that issue just a while ago that we don't want to do that. Um, in this scenario, the NERA could also be pressured to process those transactional logs in a manner, um, even if it was anonymized. And it could even be something that could be monetized, as we have seen in other jurisdictions. And when we look to Kenya and India, that have been those have actually been issues in their jurisdictions. Subject of which have subject of which have been litigation and law reform to prevent this type of thing because they didn't want ministers to be able to do this. But moreover, under the board, under the bill, it's not clear what recourse the board would have if they were to hypothetically disagree with the directives of a minister. And so we have a few recommendations here um, that we. Um, that we, that we think could address this. One, we think that the power of the minister to give directives to the board under Section 7 ought to be repealed um, respectfully. Um, and this we make laws for good times and bad and for actors we like and that we don't like. Um, and so that's, what, that's the nature of rule of law. And so no political actor in our opinion should be able to direct the manner in which the authority operates at their discretion. Um, the board is already quite stacked with government appointees anyway. Um, and second, we would establish the authority as a commission of parliament or some other independent body that is accountable to the board, inspectorate, and parliament only. We intentionally seek to avoid a, horizon, a, a vertical line of responsibility to central government in this regard, given the nature of the, the work that the NERA does. That is our recommendation. Um, moving on to position 10, which is a revision, we would hope, of what we think are some unreasonable formulations of the criminal offences. I know that the Joint Select Committee has intended and willingness to revisit the criminal offences. We're happy for that. We hope to give some specific ways that that could be done. So um, the first criminal offence is, is sections 10, 7 and 8, which is providing false information to the um, authority. Um, section 10, 7 says it's an offence if a person gives, quote, false information or makes a false statement of a material nature with the intent of obstructing or misleading the authority when providing information, basically when enrolling or when making a modification or confirming uh, um, something um, or obtaining the issue or reissue of an ID card. In general, that is sensible. It's in the specifics that we have a concern. Um, just to also clarify the offense, a person commits the offense if they knew or believed the information to be false or they were reckless as to the veracity, the truth of the information. So while persons are encouraged to be truthful, here is the issue that we have right here. Not all information provided to the authority on the section um, 10 and 11, the suite of attributes, are relevant to establishing a national identification, um, such as someone's occupation or their secondary address. And so we would suggest a, a nuancing here to say that in order to trigger the offense, the information provided has to actually undermine the authority's ability to establish identity. For example, the bill as worded could allow for criminal liability um, in circumstances where the person simply, for example, gave the wrong occupation because they were embarrassed that they were unemployed. 
Do we think that the authority is going to be hunting down persons who lied about their occupation? No. Do we think that the interpretation should ever be a, should should ever arise that because someone gave the wrong spouse's name because they were married overseas and they're in a you know, same-sex marriage and they're embarrassed to say so in Jamaica because they came here as a foreign worker, or that they're unemployed and they have an occupation and they say something or they lie by omission that the offence is intended to address them? We don't think that's the intention here. We think the intention here is to prevent people from fraudulently obtaining identity information. And so we would narrow the offense, much in line with our first recommendation about narrowing the identity attributes to simply those that are material to establishing identity. Um, the second offense that we have an issue with um, is the repeal, we would suggest actually a repeal or a major revision of the offense um, under section 1612 of failure to notify the authority if a card is lost, stolen, damaged, et cetera. So as you know, under Section 1612, um, if a person without reasonable excuse fails to tell the authority um, that their card has been lost, stolen, damaged, mutilated, or destroyed, they've committed an offense. Respectfully, we think this is a, a little bit of a disproportionate use of the police powers of the state um, here, especially since this is a voluntary and optional system. If my card is damaged in a car accident and I just don't tell the authority, I, I will be deprived of my ability to use the card, but I shouldn't really be exposed to criminal liability. If my card is stolen in a violent crime against me, and I just don't really tell the authority after a year. I just won't have the use of my card. I should not ever, should never ever trigger a criminal offense. Um, if my dog mutilated my card, it should never even raise the issue um, of criminal liability. Only that the damage that flows to me is because I have failed to notify the authority, so I can't use the card. That's a fair and balanced way to say that adverse impact flows to the, the cardholder. But to say that their failure to proactively tell the authority triggers criminal liability is a concern. Um, and then finally, on the offenses, um, oh, that, that's, it on the, that's it on the offenses. Um, and then you move on to, to cancellation. So just to, to, to reiterate on the offenses, though, um, the scenarios that we gave earlier about James and Mavis um, and Catherine here, who would have and wanted to enroll for our needs, but in specific circumstances, and Tuesday we spoke about these, may have given in information that would could technically be deemed as misleading. James, for example, did not say he had a secondary address. And as you know, the bill requires both principal and other addresses and empowers the authority to require anything, including the other addresses. James could be subject to criminal liability. If you look at Mavis, the next example, who is unemployed, but doesn't want to say so. So she says she's a domestic worker. She could not only not get her needs, which she wants to get, but she could also be exposed to criminal liability. And we take Catherine, who really doesn't really know what to do because she's a foreigner working in Jamaica for an international organization. She's married overseas in a, in a, to, a, to, a, to a woman in a country that recognizes same-sex marriage, not to get controversial here. And she doesn't really know what to do with NIDS. Jamaica doesn't recognize her marriage. We're not really going to talk about doing that for NIDS. But she decides not to disclose that information. Um, technically, she would have lied and misled the authority, and that could expose her to criminal liability. And so we would hope that these could be revisited to retool um, the offenses to make a more appropriate configuration of the state's um, use of its um, powers um, there and what really is intended to be captured by those offenses. <laughs> Just to say, um, through you, Chairman, I, Mr. Malcolm, just to say in respect of the example, your, your general point is taken, and I, and I do accept the concern that um, in the drafting of any provision in a law, and more so um, for offences, great care must be taken that we do not unwittingly um, cast the net wider than is intended. So that point is taken. But in respect of your Thank provocative you. example, um, if, if in that specific case, um, providing the information would be of no moment because constitutionally such a union would be recognized. And I suppose such an explanation would have to make sense. It would have well, to Well, I understand. I, I'm just saying. Was, so, did I, were you finished? Oh. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So. Your, your response to me there, um, Mrs. Maluhu Fort, is in relation to providing the information would have been of no moment because the union would not be recognized. Um, that's fine, but the example has two options. One, she provides it and the union is not recognized. Um, and we wanted to know what is the authority's intention there because she would have provided information. Would it be in the database or not in the database? That was the first example. The second example is that 
Catherine does not supply the information, thinking because the union is not going to be recognized, um, and therefore could be deemed by somebody else's interpretation to have misled the authority as to her marital status, because the statute has not provided guidance on any of that, um, or has misled the authority that she doesn't have a spouse, because the, the authority is empowered to require the name of the spouse. And so this is a matter that needs to more precisely be clarified under the enrollment section, but its impact by someone's interpretation, and we know when it comes to how offenses are interpreted, many times we've had situations where police interpret things far differently than prosecutors interpret things far differently than judges interpret things. And it is the risk of being caught in the net, which doesn't only exist at someone's actual conviction of the, from the offense, but all of the risks that could come from the threat and from the triggering of the criminal justice process. We would recommend here that that interpretation not be able to arise um, in this provocative example or others. But I honestly that you've taken the point generally. Um, and oh, so I'm your point is taken, yes. Um, Matthew, are, is translation you or me? It's me. Okay, all right, over to you. Yeah, you can't take a break. <laughs> all right, we're, we're coming to the end, end share. I'm um, we'll have a couple more and then we'll be wrapping up and opening for discussion with the project team. Um, so on this one, um, Chair, multiple submissions have touched on the topic of cancellation. Um, we won't go into all of it. I think we want to make, make a note of a couple points. One, that there are two can cancellation processes contemplated in the bill. Um, let me just go up. One that's contemplated um, and applicable to in section 14 1A and 2. In that case, the verb purged is used to describe what happens to the information of the enrolled individual. And then a second approach that relates to what I would categorize as general cancellations on the subsection for subsection 1B, um, where the identity information is retained by the authority, um, but the enrolled individual loses the ability to use the card, and the authority retains the ability to process the information and disclose it in certain circumstances. So generally, you know, and, and this is the section here that talks about the, you know, section 14, um, subsection 5 talks about those two different verbs and how the information is used differently. I think our general preference um, would be for all enrolled individuals to be purged in cancellations, but we also acknowledge that retaining some information is necessary to prevent individuals from enrolling multiple times and receiving multiple national ID numbers. And I think that's a compelling case to be, to be made by the state. However, we do not believe that the, pro the proposed cancellation process um, is sufficiently strong. And we think there are some easy ways to strengthen it. Um, we actually propose that the bill established under sex section 14 a right to erasure of all information that's non-essential to prevent du duplicate entries into the national ID databases. Um, as of now, it makes no distinction between information that it retains generally versus information that is needed for this purpose. And so as we've already discussed, there's quite a bit of information that the authority will generate on the individual that is beyond the identity information um, that don't need to be retained when, the when someone cancels their enrollment. Um, and so we would actually propose that that be as a new provision be added to the bill to remove, to enable the individual to a right to all of that information being removed. Um, and I'll just present an example that just kind of illustrates um, that point. So we're going to take Claude. Um, you know, it's uh, in, in the future again, the government announces some policy decision that enables broader data processing of information held by the Nero. Um, Claude, like any other individual, may become un be uncomfortable with how his authentication records or his identity information might be processed and decides that he wants to cancel his enrollment. Based on the current draft of the bill, even if Claude were to cancel his enrollment, the authority would still be empowered to retain his identity information and his authentication records, as well as continue the processing. Um, the continued processing of the authentication records is not prohibited by Section 14. The authority may also continue to process or disclose the authentication records, um, as well as Claude's identity information 
um, which in many circumstances, even with the DPA in, in force. So our recommendation are a couple of questions that we just want to ask to the project team. Um, and then our recommendations as this is whether the, is there an intention for the authority to continue processing identity info, non-identity information of enrolled individuals after they've canceled their enrollment? Um, uh, and in uh, Matthew, let me see, I, I, I will ask the team to mm -hmm. uh, respond to that directly. But yes, my understanding yeah. from previous discussion, mm -hmm. once an individual cancels his registration, everything is removed from the database. In no, other words, no, but I'm just saying my understanding is removed mm -hmm. from the database. Mm -hmm. But when he cancels, he has to um, bring back his ID card. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when he brings back his ID card, that will be retained so that in the event he returns to re register, mm -hmm. and he will get that NIN. Got it. Got it. No, I think, you know, Chair, I think that's a, a valid point. I mean, I think we should seek clarification on that. As the bill is worded currently, um, it makes a distinction. So if we look at the slide here, so um, subsection B2, so that's related to when someone cancels their enrollment, um, it's not subsection 1A or 2, which is, you know, if I'm no longer ordinarily resident in Jamaica, um, or there's some misinformation, inaccurate information that was provided. So for most people, they're going to be under subsection 2 um, for that. And so all that subsection 2 currently states is that the authority shall not begin to cease to process that inform identity information provided by the individual. It makes no provision or obligation for the authority to um, purge the information, which is the verb that's used in the section above that, or to remove it at all. And in fact, it goes even further to say that the authority may still, in 14 subsection 8b, that the authority may actually continue to process or disclose the information as related to section 24 or as it relates to 24IH under the Data Protection Act. So at least our read of it was that there's clearly going to be some information that's retained by the authority, even in the case of cancellation. Um, and that information, that identity information could be disclosed, even if I've canceled my enrollment. That's not my understanding, but I'll ask the to clear it up. Okay. Sure, Chair, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the second question, and a number of persons that have raised this, I think the general point is in the first type of cancellation, the, the word, the, the verb purge is used to describe the process. I think we just want to get clarification as to what is deleted and what's retained in that circumstance, um, as opposed to what is used in the second, circum in the second um, scenario. So our, our recommendations um, really flow from what we've shared before. I mean, um, that we reform the, the erasure process to um, also include all of the information that's non-essential for preventing duplicate registrations. I think that um, is, a, is, a, is a reasonable one. Um, right. And that in the case of three, um, an individual's, where an individual's enrollment has been canceled, there should be a limit placed on the authority's ability to process, disclose, and perform um, information um, verification services on the individual's identity that's been re that has been retained for deduplication purposes. Um, and then uh, for the first recommendation, just quickly on this one, is that in section 10.2, um, which is a section that relates to what information the authority has to communicate to the public about their enrollment in Miro when the in at the start of the enrollment process, we think it's important that and that it be the authority be required to expressly inform all persons that if they enroll in MIDS, there's no guarantee that their information will be deleted upon cancellation. Um, so I think those that would be a very transparent process to for people to understand and make informed decisions about participation. That's a good recommendation. I mean, to the extent that um, you know people will know that you know once you register especially we're thinking especially mm -hmm. unique nin because it, when you cancel mm -hmm. you can't come back later on mm -hmm. and ask a new name 
Because that mean it will, will be unique to you. Yeah. And, and, and that mean will be, I mean, it will no be never be used again for anyone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean that is a good recommendation that we should have a look at. Okay. Thank you, Chair. All right. So uh, oh, is there a question? Just, yeah, before before if we can just go back to the to the to the to the to the 14. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have a, a, a additional point there. Um because Minister is saying he's not clear on why our position is the way it is. But if you know the the yeah, thank you. So just on this minister, I just want to be very clear that there are three conditions for cancellation. One. Right. Yeah, we understand. We understand. Okay, yeah, yeah. But the, the conditions for the first two, one A and two, right? So if you look to 14, no, you're right, yeah. The one A and two, um, where you are no longer eligible um, mm -hmm. or where the authority cancels you because they need to cancel you because the information is wrong. That's where the highlighted word purge applies to. Um, for 1B, that someone cancels on their own initiative, you know, the only requirement is that the, the authority not begin or cease to process the identity information. So I would, I would, I would really want to understand, I mean, because it's, it's, it's there, it's plain in our understanding, what would give rise to your interpretation that where someone cancels, the term purged applies across the board when the statute is only applying it to one, well, the bill is only applying it to one A and two. Um, that's, that's really important for us to understand. Um, and if the project team could really explain how they would get that interpretation, I would be very grateful. And then second, separate and apart from the purging of identity information, the processing of transactional data, the authentication logs and the verification is totally unaddressed. And so 14 would not prevent any future processing of that transactional information as well. And so it's really important that we distinguish between the purge in general and the application of the purge under 14.5, as well as the inclusion of the subject matter, which is more than the identity information. Without that, then it, the, the, the purging and cancellation discussion would, would remain incomplete. So I'd be very grateful when the project team responds if we could get an understanding and a clear answer as to how 14, um, 14 5 would apply in those circumstances. Well, we, we um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, is, right. is me again? Yeah, man. Okay, thanks. So, the, I want to talk, this is quick now, we're almost wrapping up. Supporting vulnerable persons in all service interactions. So, we're very happy that the law right now um, provides some attention to the needs of persons with disabilities. And hello to persons apply for persons on behalf of children, incarcerated persons, and the mentally ill. But we think it could go a, a lot further. Section 5.7 um, requires that the authority, quote, have regard to the needs of persons with disabilities in the performance of its function. Um, we think that could be improved in a few ways. One, it, one, it only mentions people with disabilities, but they're not the only group that would be deserving of special attention. Um, and so that, that's one thing that we would suggest that we actually expand this general mandate to people with disabilities to actually other vulnerable and socially excluded groups given the functions such and so many areas of life, such as children, the elderly, literate persons, the homeless, non-English speakers, persons who are sick. Um, those, those can so expand that general catch-all having regard. The second is that having regard to person with disabilities only um, is a, a little bit less progressive than where most um, accommodation language is going now. And we would propose the standard language that we would get even with Disabilities Act, which would be the obligation to make reasonable accommodation and perform other forms of support, um, not just the people with disabilities and those other groups. So we would just expand, we, that's, that's our makeup recommendation to, on, on the general mandate. Um, the second has to do with um, protecting the mentally ill. So section 10.4b of the bill um, allows someone to apply for enrollment of a person with a mental disorder within the meaning of the Mental Health Act if they are the nearest relative of that person. While this is good, it's important that having recognized that having a mental disorder as a family in the Mental Health Act does not automatically render someone incapable of conducting their affairs um, or providing informed consent, which is really what the crux of the enrollment piece should um, rely on. And so for us, um, we would instead recommend um, that Section 11.4b be amended to require that in circumstances 
or a person seeks to enroll a person with a mental disorder, that the person be enrolled, that the person to be enrolled consents to the enrollment unless it has been demonstrated that they lack the capacity to consent or are unlikely to retain such capacity and that the enrollment is in their best interest. Simply saying that you can apply if you are the next relative as defined by the Mental Health Act doesn't actually deal with the issue um, of if the, if the person is capable of consenting. For example, people with bipolar disorder um, may would, be, would have a mental disorder under the Mental Health Act. With people with bipolar disorder on treatment, work in government, work in private sector, conduct their business is quite fine. I know many of them. And so the law, as stated, just would need to be tweaked to address that. Section, we would also recommend that Section 114B, which also deals with mental disability, be amended to require that in circumstances where a person seeks to enroll a person with a mental disorder, that the authority be obligated to make a basic and reasonable inquiry into whether the person proposed to be enrolled has the capacity to consent and only process the enrollment once it's satisfied that the enrollment is in the best interest of the person. This is also key to preventing people taking advantage of enrolling persons um, who are mentally ill and then using their, once they're in control of them, using their um, ID and card um, to conduct business on their affairs because they're mentally unwell. This basic inquiry um, would be useful. Um, as it relates to children, um, we're very happy that um, people, other people can apply for children. Um, we would expand this in two ways, however. Um, we would recommend that Section 114A be expanded to include any person with lawful custody or care of a child, such as long-term foster parents. At present, what the bill says, it allows for a person in charge of a child care facility um, to, to apply for enrollment on behalf of a child at the facility. Um, but there are persons who wouldn't be operating a facility like a foster parent who maybe has a fit person order instead of a, um, in, in, in just that not running a facility, who would be equally in such a circumstance. The children advocate also raised the issue of children in conflict with the law and recommended the facility manager. Additionally, however, as a safeguard there, because children in childcare facilities are broad, they could be there for, for two weeks, they could be there for on a, on a place of safety and not in a fit person order, um, in which case parental rights have not really been transferred. Um, so we'd amend section 114A to limit the power of managers of childcare facilities and any other person who isn't a parent or guardian to enroll a child to only circumstances where parental rights have been severed or a child is in long-term state care through a legal instrument like a fit person order. Again, children in Jamaica stay in places of safety for years sometimes um, without having parental rights transferred. Further, where such applications are to be made, the bill should require notification of the parent or guardian where they are still living and allow for any reasonable period of response prior to processing the enrollment. Um, that's just an important safeguard. Um, and so we think those five recommendations taken together, the general mandate, the two on mentally ill persons and the two on children would help provide a more complete um, support for different categories of persons who are um, in need of um, special assistance. Um, recommendations 13, uh, making, uh, position 13, sorry, making appeals process more accessible. Um, this is focusing on two issues. One is a technical issue, um, which is the definition of an applicant, of an appellant. So section 26.2 states that the appellant must be an enrolled individual um, if they were to apply for any decision, but the tribunal has jurisdiction over any decision the, tribune, uh, the, the authority makes. Um, under Section 2, an enrolled individual is defined as an individual whose identity information is stored in the national identification databases. So you have to have your information stored to be an enrolled individual, and to be an appellant, you have to be an enrolled individual. This, however, creates a kind of a technical challenge um, in which the current definition of an appellant would not include an individual who is denied enrollment and who wants to appeal in a strict sense of how the Section 2 and 26.2 are worded. Um, and who wishes to appeal that decision. We think this is mainly an error, and we don't think that's your intention, because in sections 10 and 14, you clearly allow for decisions related to enrollment to be challenged. And so it's simply about the technical precision of the definition of the word appellant, which seems to be in conflict with sections 10 and 14, which contemplate an unenrolled person also being able to appeal. So that, that, that would just need to be tweaked. Um, and we would also look at the time allowed for appeal. So there's a 28-day period allowed for appeals under the Act. 
we think it's short um, um, compared to both the general understanding of how government works, but also other appeal processes in other legislations. We look at like a 90-day appeal period in the appeal Access Information Act, for example. And so we think that it's likely that when people have issues with the authority, um, they're going to first attempt to resolve the issue by contacting the authority instead of immediately appealing it. Um, but the time starts running from the date of the decision. Um, so that process of corresponding with government is not normally quick. It could be that they take a month to go back and forth. They may even appeal the inspectorate first and complain. And all of that time, you know, 28 days would have been gone. Now, we think that there's really no need to constrain appeals to 28 days. And while the bill does grant the tribunal some discretionary power to extend the period in which an application may be may, appeal may be lodged, um, that's totally at their discretion. And the underlying issue is that the short window is doesn't need to be that short. And so we would recommend expanding that. And then finally, this this is a little this is an interesting one. Um, the appeals tribunal's power to regulate its own proceedings is normally a power we give the tribunals. Um, in section the second schedule, particularly um, section nine, um, the appeals tribunal has this broad power to regulate its own proceedings, um, and that includes how maybe evidence may be supplied, how arguments are given, notices are served, that kind of stuff. Um, we are concerned, however, that in a circumstance like this, which could deal with if someone gets an ID or not gets an ID, how the information is used and other sensitivities, that regulations would be a better place to outline the operational procedures for the tribunal. Um, right now, delegating that power to the tribunal entirely, which could change and change its rules of procedure with each new tribunal, um, is not, in our opinion, an appropriate way to delegate that authority, given the decision-making power of this tribunal and the degree to which the decisions may impact persons' ability to participate um, in society in full. And so we think those three recommendations, again, the definitions of an appellant, um, the time period for an, for, of, of, an, of, an, of, an, of an appeal, which we think should be at least 90 days, and the delegated power to regulate the um, affairs of the tribunal would help improve um, the tribunal's um, transparency, accountability, and the degree to which it um, satisfies the types of oversight we think it ought to. And with that, over two days, we are grateful for the time um, to present these core positions, and we look forward to hearing the responses and engaging with them as well. Thanks again for your attention. Yeah, Roger, I want to thank you very much, yourself and Matthew, for the very extensive assessment of the bill. I had the opportunity to look at your written submissions and also to let you know that, in fact, um, a comprehensive response has been prepared by the NIDS team to your submission, which will also be sent to you. So I'm going to ask the NIDS team now to, to respond. Go ahead, um, Kanita. Good afternoon, Minister. We will try our best to respond um, in a timely manner. However, initially, we must note that having only received this document, which went a little bit differently from the previous submission, we were not able to complete all the slides. However, we will still try to respond as best as possible, utilizing what we have before us. Um, just two points before we go on. Um, we noted the indication that uh, JFJ was aware of what is in the DPA and uh, um, therefore it appeared that we would not, you know, any response with regard to that would not be sufficient. However, I believe it's important to indicate to Jamaica, to the committee, that the DPA, the Data Protection Act, will be, for want of a better word or phrase, the supreme law governing data privacy and protection, notwithstanding the type of data that you are utilizing or processing, it will still be the supreme piece of legislation. And that the information commissioner has been given the authority to do certain things to ensure that the any type of institution will be able to be in line with that particular piece of legislation. That's why the register is there where you will have to indicate the type of um, information, data that you'll be processing. That's why data um, impact assessments are part of the legislation. 
Additionally, it was stated at the last meeting that we indicated that data sharing would, right, as you were speaking about, or rather as Jeff J was speaking about clause 24, the concept of data sharing and my response to same was indicated in regards to clause 24. Now, I had responded as it relates to data sharing previously. However, that was as it related to data sharing um, only in with, with regard to that respect, not data sharing just willy-nilly. It's just data sharing for particular instances and only with the consent of the um, individual, the enrolled individual, unless, of course, the carve outs in section 20, on clause 24 or um, section 24 of the Data Protection Act and any other carve out that may exist in any law or within Data Protection Act would apply. All right, so let us start now with regard to, we're going to go consecutively as usual. So, section one, you had indicated that you. Somebody, has their, uh, somebody has their audio. Move oh. those. Just turn off your audio, whoever is not on, to avoid the, the distraction. distraction. Mm -hmm. Sir, can we go? go ahead. Eh? Okay, sir. All yeah. right. So, clause one. So, JFJ had indicated that they wanted the bill to be amended to require the DPAs to be in place. Um, so, that's an administrative decision. That wouldn't be something that would be necessarily encapsulated in legislation. That would be, so that was, is, is a matter that we refer to the committee. Um, right. You would like the, or rather the JFJ, pardon me, through you, Chair, the JFJ would appreciate the bill's current definition of identity information to only be to only be the information necessary to create in or proving a legal identity. Um, our response to that is that the existing definition captures the policy intent of the bill. Um, reference is also made to our response, which we will give below, outlining the rationale for collection of the different data attributes. Um, JFJ also recommended that the objects of the bill be amended to include explicit reference to promoting and protecting the human rights and fundamental freedoms of persons in the society. Uh, that is already within the Constitution. However, we refer that to the committee um, as to whether or not they believe that that object should be included. Um, secondly, or rather, with regard to the objects, the JFJ also recommended that the, an object be included to indicate that the act, the bill rather, would be to facilitate access to legal identification. What we have indicated is that the committee may wish to consider incorporating language into the bill to note that the bill seeks to facilitate the recognition and protection of the legal identity of an individual. What does legal identification, let me get an understanding, what is the coalition's um, concept of legal identification? Well, um, that's, a that's a hard one. Um, I think it is, it is a form of recognizing a person um, as a unique individual that is Often, it is authorized by the government as therefore being valid. Um, it is what opens the NIDS policy 2020 um, as identity, as a human right, those are the words. Mm -hmm. And the basis that has been said in the NIDS documentation from before, that the purpose of this bill is to facilitate increased access to legitimate forms of identification, um, which we support. The only request here is that that does not find its way as an expressive, as an express object in the bill. And given that that has been repeated multiple times as the purpose of this bill, we think it would be useful to include it in objects. And I think the projects team is effectively saying that they would, that the committee should, rec should could consider that as well. I don't, that as not, as not being contentious. If I understood you correctly, Ms. Facey. Right, not necessarily access to legal identification, but recognition and protection sure. of legal identity. Right. No problem. Okay, as it relates to clause five, um, you had indicated several, through you to the coalition, through you here to the coalition, several um, areas within clause five that you, that the coalition 
was suggesting amendments. Um, so clause five, three, and four to amend the functions and powers of the authority to include the observation of human rights again, which you had already referred to in the, 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 the disturbance is there again, right? Is it yours? Um, it may be me. Month? It may be me, Minister. Yeah, it's so the quite, right. Yes, it is me. I'm so or sorry. Fan, fan or yes, unfortunately, I'm in a windowless room, but I will. All right, we'll continue. I will persevere. All right, so establish the authority as a commission of parliament, which um, the committee has already addressed um, with regard to the, the observation of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Similarly to the objects, we, would, so we will um, refer that to the committee with regard to a new section be established to mandate that the authority have due regard to the circumstances and needs of vulnerable groups in executing its functions and make reasonable accommodation and provide special assistance at all stages of their interactions with the authority. Um, notwithstanding the reference to the Disabilities Act, we will refer this to the committee as well, um, whether or not the placement within the objects is the best placement is something for consideration. Now, this one was a new, one of the new issues that we were able to go through from your presentation. And this was a question, given that the NIDS project team has publicly stated the objective to operationalize Nero sufficiently to have the capacity to issue cards by September. How are they configuring the system for data processing without knowing the requirements to be included in the Data Protection Act's regulations? All right, so firstly, let's make it clear that the comment was made within the context and with the condition and understanding that the appropriate legislative framework would be in place. I believe it was actually, if the, 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 um, it was stated something to the effect that once the appropriate legislative framework is in place, cards could be rolled out in September, or words to that nature. Now, the solution is configurable and responsive to process changes. So we'll be able to meet the requirements of these data protection. The solution itself will be able to meet the requirements of data protection and privacy rules. Um, it's, anticipate, it's important to approach systems implementation, we believe, in this manner in order to adopt future improvements and to, to, to be able to easily make the modifications. So it's anticipated that once the regulations are in place, further assessment will be done and the necessary configurations applied to ensure that the solution is in compliance with the applicable laws and regulations, and that's before the needs is piloted. Now, the outcome of the pilot of the needs is likely to inform further changes that are not yet known before full rollout. And so even after full rollout, there will be a life cycle for continuous improvement of the system, as well as continuous monitoring for compliance with the DPA and the relevant laws by the board, the inspectorate, and the authority itself. As it relates to the ministerial directions, you had, I'm sorry, when I say you, <laughs> the coalition had indicated, is okay. <laughs> had indicated, or rather had suggested that the power of the minister to give directives to the board be repealed, as no political actor should be able to, di to direct the manner in which the authority operates. So we have indicated that the committee has indicated that it's going to be revisited the governance structure and oversight framework in the bill. But we believe it's important to note that these are policy direct, or rather general directives, um, directives of directions of a general character that are related to policy. And just to remind Jamaica and the committee and um, everyone here and watching that constitutionally policy is within the purview of the cabinet. And that is why the minister may be able to give directions of a general character about the policy of a government or public body, because they will be the ones implementing the overall policy. As it relates to the national databases, now you had indicated that the act should place limitations on the kind of data that could be shared and accessed across multiple platforms linked to the unique identifier. Now, this is already encapsulated in the bill. 
as, as far as we are concerned in the different sections or clauses. And also this bill has to be considered, I'm sorry, within the framework of the Data Protection Act, <laughs> which limits processing and disclosure to the minimum necessary for the purpose for which the data was collected. And as I indicated, we'll go down, when we reach to the appropriate section, we'll indicate different attributes and why we think those are necessary. Now, section 10 to, you hadn't indicated this in your um, presentation. I don't know if it is you didn't, you are withdrawing that. You were saying that it should be amended to require that the authority, um, oh no, you had indicated this, right? So section 10.2 should be amended to require that the authority expressly inform all persons upon enrollment that there is no guarantee that their information will be deleted, will be deleted upon cancellation. And the committee, we believe the committee may wish to consider this recommendation as it will lead to informed consent or a greater level of informed consent to round out that area. With regard to enrollment, you were indicating that um, in order to trigger, okay, this is with regard to the offense of committing a criminal offense if a person provides false information or makes a false statement of a material nature with the intention of obstructing or misleading the authority when they're giving the authority the information for particular purposes. And then you also looked at several scenarios. Um, sorry, it's just that I am now trying to put them in Right. So you also looked at scenario two with James and three with um, Mavis, I believe. And then there was four with Sarah and her wife from overseas. OK, as it relates to. Right. And you also um, agreed that you doubted that the, the 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 legislation would be utilized as a for want of a better word, a hammer for particular persons. If our view or understanding of that section is that the obstruction or misleading um, by the applicant would be so egregious that it would go towards the functioning of the authority. So it would impact on the functions of the authority. Uh, I'm sorry, on the authority being able to discharge its functions in such a manner. None of these cases that have been highlighted would do that. So your recommendation was. Um, you needed to, in order to trigger the offense, the bill should require that the information provided has demonstrably undermined the authority, right? And we agree that the information would need to be proved in court in order to establish that that commission, that the offense was actually committed. However, even to bring it to, to charge would, of course, require some reasonableness, and we don't believe that this is a reasonable interpretation of that particular clause, nor do we believe that it would be interpreted, interpreted in that manner. Okay, now you also went on to say that the bill should explicitly limit the offense to only identity information required to establish a person's identity and exclude decisions not to disclose non-essential information. Okay, so with regard to this particular response, it has to be linked with what we don't agree that uh, any of the information provided is really non-essential in keeping with the tenets of um, human or um, legal identity as a human right. It is also necessary to protect that unique legal identity. And one of the ways to do that is to ensure, well, first of all, to establish that the person is indeed unique, is to utilize, um, you know, as much information as you can, while still ensuring that you are not stepping over the minimization rule, right? And we believe that the data set that has been put into the bill, which by the way, may be required. So, you know, it's not going to be necessary in all cases or required in all cases. And that's why the discretion is given to the authority to indicate sufficiency or rather to determine sufficiency is necessary to be able to one, ensure that this person or be able to say to someone that you may recognize this person as Roger Malcolm, who is 
sitting here before me versus Roger Malcolm, who is somewhere else in Jamaica, lives somewhere else, married to somebody, are not married, etc. Right? Okay. So perhaps I should go to the two scenarios then. So James lives in Balaclava, right? You're saying then, so his basis, his basis for registering with the needs is he needs an ID to qualify for the summer work program. And he lists his town address because he thought it would look better on his job application. The authority has required that all addresses be included in applications. The authority has required, or rather may require, that all addresses be included. Now, reference is made to clause 11.2b, right? Now the application, oh, so you also went on to say that the impact is that um, when they verified James' address, the authority learns he didn't disclose his address in St. Elizabeth and therefore denied his application for lack of accuracy. Okay. Now, reference is made to clause 11.2b. An application for enrollment may only be denied under the bill where it is found that the application, that the information submitted was not sufficient for enrollment. No, the inaccuracy of the information provided, simplicity, is not a basis for denial of the application. The verification process may very well result in highlighting several inaccuracies. And so the authority would indicate that to the applicant who may or may not decide to provide correct information or additional information. However, once an accurate principal address has been provided, that information would be deemed sufficient to satisfy the address requirement for the basis of enrollment. So he would not be prevented from enrolling on that basis, right? So now let's look at the elements. You also indicated that James is told that he's misled the authority and could be charged with an offense because he didn't list both the grandma's name and his address in Balaclava and could be subject to a fine up to $3 million. Now, the elements of the offense are established where the applicant would have provided misleading information with the intent to obstruct or mislead the authority to carry out its functions. We don't believe that Jack has demonstrated this intention beyond a reasonable doubt in this instance, right? And it's important to note, though, we're not condoning ever the um, giving identity, providing identity information that is not accurate um, because the provision of accurate and fulsome information serves to better enable the authority to protect the identity information of the enrolled individual and also to ensure that the, the legal identity of the person that is being recognized is a unique, strong legal identity. And the provision of inaccurate information will therefore damage the integrity of the system, and it would also serve to facilitate identity theft and fraud, which helps no one. As it relates to um, your scenario two, Mavis, I believe, indicated she was unemployed. No, I'm sorry, Mavis indicated that she was a domestic worker when she was really unemployed. Um, occupation, however, doesn't refer to employment status. So in that instance, she would be well within her right to put domestic worker instead of unemployment. In any event, again, we don't believe that that is a situation that would rise to um, even sending anything to the DPP requesting that this person be charged. I'm trying to ensure I am going through everything. Well, put it another way, <laughs> Yes. Mean, um, Roger and Matthew. The NITS team have prepared a 28-page response. So can we guys highlight? Thus far. <laughs> some of them. So, and what is more to Matthew and Ranjay, because of the additional material you brought in the oral presentation, I will ask Kamika, as she indicated, to probably add, you know, one or two, um, just as she's doing now, highlighting some of the issues that were not raised in right. your presentation. So I think, I don't know, Camille, if there are any other points you'd like to raise now. Feel well, to put in the written response to them. All, all right. right. Um, there were some pressing issues, I believe, that they go ahead, had. Go ahead. 
the no, sufficiency of who who should go ahead minute you 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 okay right so they had certain um questions that they had asked sure. so for instance it was asked is it the position of the government or jsc members that the authority should be empowered to deny individuals access to legal identification based on a failure or unwillingness to provide identity information and to that the response is that no that's not the policy intent and is not reflective of the, pos the provisions of the bill uh, what was the government's rationale in departing from the principles and data collection scope it's outlined in the policy document informing the drafting of the NERA bill? There hasn't been a departure from the principles of data collection outlined in the policy. We believe that the data set outlined in the bill remains adequate, relevant, and limited to what is needed for the purposes for which the data is being processed. Um, it's important to note that address and marital status formed a part of the required biographic information that was stated in the policy. And to give you examples of the, the attributes, the names of the mother and father would be critical, particularly for minor applicants. The name of the spouse will flow from marital status. And you'll note even when you're applying for a passport, you are required to provide that information. Nationality, country, place of birth, critical to determine the eligibility of the applicant. Um, what was the right? Also, policy is not fixed. It may change during the legislative process, even as it's illustrated here in our current exercise. Discussions with stakeholders served to highlight data gaps that were not addressed by the policy as indicated, as um published. It was determined that the data attributes outlined in the bill are necessary in order to ensure that the information that is provided is provided only once and that it will allow for the recognition of a unique legal identity, a strong unique legal identity. And also it was to assist Jamaicans who are without the resources to access the formal financial system to be able to satisfy KYC requirements without more. So JFJ has, and the coalition, I'm sorry, has indicated a suggestion for a value added system. And we appreciate that. Um, it would, of course, add funding to the government's coffers and hopefully to ours as a result, generally as citizens. However, um, it is a policy intent for financial inclusion and it is not thought necessary or in the best interest of anyone to to require persons who are already not financially included, who are already not a part of the, the um, formal financial sector, and as a result, unable to access certain things for themselves, to require them to then have to pay extra to be able to obtain this particular um, level of access, which is what the value, from what we understand, the value-based um, suggestion would end up doing. Okay, as it relates to amending the bill, right, so the JFJ and the coalition also indicated that they believe the bill should be amended to clarify the authority's discretion under 11.2, and it should clearly state that once an individual provides sufficient information to establish their identity, the authority cannot deny their enrollment in our estimation that is what it states however this is a, um appears to be a drafting issue and so we would refer that to the cpc um section 11.4 spoke to the 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 custody and care of a child and that issue was raised before by boj um and also the committee was advised by that time by the CPC that the bill effectively states what you are actually requesting. All right, as it relates, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do the contentious, what was it? The provocative, I believe, um, scenario. Now, in both cases, the ladies would not fall into the category of misleading or obstructing the um, authority because in instance one, the authority is subject to the constitution of Jamaica. Spouse as defined in some legislation, it's either you're married, man and woman, or male and, and female, or you're living with 
a male as a female or a female as a male as in a manner similar to man and wife or wife, I'm sorry, woman and husband. Accordingly, there would not be the, the, the um, she would be well within her right not to indicate spouse. Should she indicate spouse, we would have to, uh, the authority indicate that that would not be possible to enter into the system because that is not a concept that is recognized under Jamaican law. Because it is not a concept recognized under Jamaican law, for her to, she is therefore single, as is what's it, Sarah and Catherine, I don't remember their names. They're both essentially single. And that is, so her putting single on the application would also not be misleading the authority. Okay. Um, I don't know if there is any, oh, the mental disorder. All right, you had indicated that you wanted to amend to require that in circumstances, the person must demonstrate, the person to be enrolled, um, it must be demonstrated that the person lacks the capacity to consent. And you had gone on to indicate that in your understanding, um, mental disorder under the Mental Health Act doesn't um, covers persons who may just have, for instance, bipolar disorder, they may still be able to make decisions, etc. However, a reading of the Mental Health Act indicates that mental disorder means a substantial disorder of thought, perception, orientation, or memory, which grossly impairs a person's behavior, judgment, or capacity to recognize reality, or ability to meet the demands of life, which renders a person to be of unsound mind or mental retardation where such a condition is associated with abnormally aggressive or seriously irresponsible behavior. So we don't believe that in any of those cases, it would be possible for the person to give consent. Um, what we do note, however, we noted it was not, this is not the first submission that noted it, that persons may be taken advantage of. And consequently, we had indicated to the committee or suggested to the committee that this could be considered for a different approach to be considered. And in my research, I have seen in the Fingerprints Act in a particular instance where a medical certificate is utilized instead of a court process, which would serve to disenfranchise way too many persons um, who may wish to be enrolled. So the, we put that to the committee for its consideration. Um, is there any part, there's so much, I don't know. <laughs> what is it that you would wish me to, to address? 14? Well, I think, so, I mean, without responding, uh, we have response, but without responding, it would be really useful to hear um, your interpretation of our positions as it relates to the risks, particularly in the future, on the transactional logs. Okay, okay. As it relates to the transactional logs, now our understanding yeah. is yes, there are still questions under even the GDPR as to what um, a transactional log is and how it can be protected under DPA or GDPR as it is in that instance. Now, mm -hmm. in my research, however, there was an overwhelming um, tendency towards whatever is in the transactional log that relates to personal data makes transactional logs now become a part of the treatment that is meted out to instances of personal data. And as a result of that, we believe that that would indeed fall under the authority in that the authority would be required to treat those logs in the same manner um, as identity information, which is a subset in our estimation of personal data. Um, as it relates to your concern now under clause 24 uh -huh. about the identity information not being mentioned, I'm sorry, all information not being enough. mentioned. Well, you not only, well, you had just said- Yeah, all information. information mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at clause 30, um, well, firstly, the, 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 the bill does indicate in several instances that information, not just identity information, but information must be treated in accordance with the principles of the Data Protection Act. Secondly, the secrecy and confidentiality duty is extended to all information, not just identity information. It isn't appropriate, we believe, 
to indicate information within clause 24 because clause 24 only speaks to identity information and because information is referred to generally elsewhere we believe it is appropriately covered um there was something else could I just press you on that point specifically, though? I mean, I've responded on the others, but we can talk about those later. But the transaction logs. So you started okay. with mm -hmm. the premise. Yeah, you start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you started with the premise that mm -hmm. it's kind of unclear right now. Is that an accurate statement? Like in terms of the, def the incorporation of transaction logs right now as a matter of GPA, you've given how you think it would be treated, but... Would it be safe to say it's not fully resolved at present? Well, nothing in law is fully resolved ever. I know, I know, Miss Facey, but um, okay. But, but what I can say is that from my understanding, transactional logs mm -hmm. would still be information that we have to protect. And once it is, it can be linked to anybody, it will be personal mm -hmm. data. So we would have to remove all the attributes before we can process it for any other reason. We can't disclose transactional logs at this point in time under the bill that is before you. We can only disclose identity information as defined in the bill. And we can't disclose transactional logs as being a part of any other type of information unless um, without running into the duty oh that is on the clause 30. Okay, so a few things there. So the you said you can't disclose any other information apart from entity information. Um, though the bill doesn't prohibit it, no. you don't want to put the prohibition in 24 because no, that speaks to identity that. information. No. Mm -mm. I said the bill. Oh, I just thought you said you can't disclose transactional information right. under the bill because it would, in your estimation, be prevented by the Data Protection Act, even though it's not and specifically also, prohibited. No, no. It's also specifically prohibited under clause 30 in of this. And 30, but isn't 30 the obligation to secrecy and confidentiality? Uh huh. For, and therefore, uh, we for can't information disclose. once disclosed, no, no. But therefore, no, it's, no, it's no, it's no. Hold, not hold on. Okay, let me just let me just make the. Oh, you can you, you have a different opinion, obviously, but let me just make the point. So, you have permission to disclose identity information in narrow circumstances mm -hmm. under Section Twenty Four. Right. The bill does not prevent expressly the disclosure of transaction logs. Your reasoning is that Section Thirty's obligation to secrecy prevents it. That would, however, prevent disclosure of identity information, but the narrow circumstances in 24 would allow for it. That's one interpretation. The DPA specifically allows for exemptions to the non-disclosure pro provisions and the first standards of processing, which include disclosure in a number of ways. So let's say it's not, say we don't, say you, do, you disagree and we don't want to include any regulation of transactional data in the NIDS bill. We want it there, but you don't want to put it there. So you rely on the DPA, right? The DPA allows for you to process the data, which includes um, disclosure, um, if, the, if the data control, in this case, in NERA, has any legal obligation, um, if, any con if any law confers an exercise of a public function to that data control, in which case that would be the NERA, which would be an, an exemption from the first, which basically a reason to process the data, which includes disclosure, any exercise of any other function of a public nature, legitimate interest of the data controllers or those to whom the data is disclosed. And then section 24 allows the minister which could to make an order exempting those standards. So that's as it relates to the disclosure of a person's individual transaction records, which could be feasible under the DPA, um, which generally isn't a problem because no other entity but needs will kind of have that information. But beyond the, um, the specific... Uh Hold on, but beyond the specific thing of the individual disclosure, mm -hmm. I would be curious if you want to respond to further. There is a, also the concern about the anonymized processing, i.e. the creation of profiles, which does not present a individual privacy risk, right? Well, how are you and going to profile anybody if it's anonymized? Who are you profiling? No, what, when I say anonymized, are you the, disclosure, the disclosure is anonymized. So the DPA particularly speaks to this. The DPA, the DPA allows for mm -hmm. exemptions to the standards so long as what you disclose is not personally identifying the data subject, right? And I see Matthew has his hand up. So I would be curious to understand what provisions, whether in the NERA or the DPA, would prevent, for example, analysis to be run on the transaction logs, 
um, and aggregate data not identifying an individual disclosed, which is which serves a perverse interest generally, but doesn't breach a privacy interest. And I'm, I was comforted in a previous joint select committee by a response that you provided, which is that, that something like that ought not occur because the processing of the transaction logs would only be to facilitate an individual's right of access to their information. That type of limitation, which would reflect a policy intent, is not captured in the bill and is not invocable by DPA. So how would that be a safeguard that one would have? Yeah, all right, may, may I just interject? Um, Chairman, may I just interject on this? Yes, go ahead. If, if it is that the concern is about the right to privacy and a violation of the right beyond what would be, uh, what, what would be acceptable and permissible, in that case, I can't see how the issue uh, well, I, I'm grappling with the issue because if, as Ms. Pacey has indicated, there is anonymization of the data, which is protecting that actual right. I, I'm, the point is lost on me beyond that. I believe sure. me, um, so there are two point, okay. go, so there are two things. There's a privacy issue, uh, Mrs. Baluhu Fort, which we're kind of going back and forth on. We don't really agree, but we're going back and forth on it. And then there is the, outside of the privacy point, there is the manner and purposes to which the analysis of the data, the processing of the data is put. So outside of privacy, we are concerned, as you've seen elsewhere, that when digital ID providers collect large amounts of data, they then process that data for purposes that are concerning, whether for commercial purposes, political Sachi, purposes. Sachi. Okay, Sachi and so that, that stuff, the privacy stuff is separate. Yeah, and so, but Sachi. I see Matthew, I figure you want to get in. Yeah, for now. And, and, and Chair um, AG, and I think this is one of the points where we really have to be cognizant of the ways that the technology also facilitates the potential um, prejudicing of the, the population, right? Because the information itself, as I think as Kamika was acknowledging, the information itself and what the broader discourse globally around logs da log data is, is a gray area. Right, there is way there are ways in which log information can be stored and can be retained that does not necessarily strictly fall within a definition of personally identifiable information. But the point that we're making is not so much even just focused on that, is that even the anonymized and the pseudonymized processing of that information potentially creates a risk for the population. And so yo, even yo. in case where that information is retained, we need to have some guidelines and safeguards around its processing. Understood. Understood. Thank you for the clarity. Understood. Okay, but um, may I just say that mm -hmm. Roger and Matthew, so, I think I've, no, I've heard your concerns and um, Ms. Pacey, that is something that the committee will have to address to what extent the regulations can restrict the use of the, um, you know, the authentication or the request so that that does not become a part of any um, material to be utilized. So Minister, Minister, I see, I see the issue actually as a much wider issue. Yeah, I've, I've seen it too. In R&D, in research and development, right, exactly. there are issues of concern to a segment of a consuming population. How may I better increase the quality of the product or the service that I'm offering to the extent that data collected reveals certain concerns, even without um, identifying the particular consumer. So it's a much wider issue. No, no, ex no, AG, I accept that. No, is no, a no. valid one, but like AG, I said, AG, AG, what, I'm, what I'm really trying to say is that we need to find a way and CPC in the legislation to ensure that we curb the possibility, even the possibility of these requests and authentication being utilized in any way outside pure identification. That's the point that mm -hmm. I'm trying to make. In other yeah. words, and, and Minister, min, 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 Minister, if I may, additionally, we are we are not beholden to the way that we have crafted our recommendation. We've expressed the intent. So if in drafting, the, the team can find a way to address these concerns that is not the way that we have recommended, we are really, we are totally okay with that, but we, we, we are concerned um, that it, it doesn't seem to be, to, to be fully addressed. And I know that we're wrapping up, 
But a good example of this um, is a, a special request I have here in Ms. Face's response. In responding to the identity information piece, um, she was at pains to say that, you know, me, you know, we are either maybe being a little bit unreasonable in the interpretation that we have because an application would only ever be denied if someone provided insufficient information and that inaccurate information would never be a basis for denial. This is actually a request that this be put in the bill because somebody else, I get, just an example of this. Somebody, no, but it's not Miss Facey. It says in the bill that the authority no, has a broad... No, we can't. No, but, we can't. no but, but, but I'm saying the constraint, so the constraint on the discretion no, is what is not... Malcolm, the may I respond no, to you on no, this? No, no, you wanted the response before you... Just, just before Miss Facey no, comes in. Chairman, Chairman, just before Miss Facey comes in. The bigger point that I understand Mr. Malcolm and his team and others have made is must be taken in the language use because whereas the intention may be one thing if there isn't a careful drafting of the provision to accurately reflect what is intended the law is being used by different persons and one may interpret it in a particular way so the big point is just the care in the language used in the provision okay. could, could we hear from the I agree, Madam hold, hold I agree. a second mr malcolm judith the cpc judith grant would like to intervene and CPC, you wanted to make Yes, a... thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Chair, care should be taken in the language, but care should also be taken in the reading. And um, I noted, Ms. Facey, I mentioned um, <laughs> Clause 30, but also one should, could also have a look at Clause 23, which also speaks to information generally, not just identity information. And that really... Um, contain some provisions dealing with how um, information should be secured and kept confidential and requires that technical and manual security measures be taken to protect the information, not just identity information, from unauthorized access, unauthorized use, unauthorized disclosure, and any loss or distortion. Yes. Good addition, Madam CPC. But the issue that it's not unauthorized CPC. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Madam CPC, it okay. would have been authorized. Okay. The issue is not that it's not accuracy. authorized. Okay. No, but but moreover, it, it, only, it only applies, final point, final point. It only it specifically applies things like encryption only to the identity information. Just for example, in several places throughout the bill, it establishes, a, it specifically applies certain things just to identity information. I think the point is clear, That's apart from just like defending that you could read. Please. Put it, ahead, all right, CP, it, it literally says it. But no, I understand, no, no, no. I hope that these are considered. Yeah, I'll, I'll rest. Um, Judith, you wanted to respond? Or you did already? No. I, I did already right. here, thank you. All right, no, just a second. Um, um, Ms. Ms. Fisi, you're yes, going to... Sir. You're going to just update the um, responses for the um, Jamaicans of Justice and it's um, the team, civil society team. So that um, what we would say, um, uh, Mr. Malcolm, uh, please, if there are additional concerns after the responses are sent, we don't have a problem you send in, uh, you know, some written comments. Okay. So what I want to do now, oh. we, have a, we have a lockdown. And, and people want to go and do some business. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, we have some final points, comments from you, Matthew and Ronje. Well, I suppose it's finished. Sorry. I was gonna maybe just ask a quick question. Not, I don't want to sort of own up another kind of worms, but one of the important parts of the legislation it relates to the Data Protection Act and what operationalization means. I don't know if the the Joint Select Committee or the project team has a, a quick response on no, I, I, how we're ultimately treating that. We can't speak to the upper mm -hmm. um, operationalization of the DPA. We can, however, indicate that we believe that there are other mechanisms for data protection elsewhere within particular industries within this particular bill that will still be useful for persons should the, um, DP, the DPA not be operationalized and are operationalized, but in a particular manner for NERA only. Okay, thanks. Ranjay, any point? Okay, thank you. 
Yes, so in closing, one, um, one, really just a lot of gratitude. This is the first Joint Select Committee that has given me written responses to the different things that we have said. And I want to genuinely congratulate you on demonstrating um, consideration of the points, now not withstanding the disagreements. Um, in closing, I, I want to reiterate and clarify where I think where the AG kind of took us, which is that, yes, we need to have care and interpretation, but as you've seen throughout this process, multiple people have come with very similar interpretations of how this provision, particularly on identity, identity information and other information, are interpreted by them, council, law professors, and the responses have been kind of the same. Hold on. Yes, I said ma'am. what I know. You, you, you slipped it there. I, I was actually aiding you by saying I understood your submission to be given the multiplicity of interpretations of provisions. So, but I think you just reversed it. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Madam AG, that there are, there are multiplicity of interpretations from several persons. Um, and you have suggested that greater care, notwithstanding maybe the positions that the drafters may have about the precision of the statute, great care is needed to avoid um, undue multiplicity of interpretation for something that should be clear. That's how, no, that's how I understood just it. To say though, no, just accuracy. to say though, hold on, just to say though. What? I thought I was just... Yeah, hold on, just hold on, because it's a yeah. it's exchange that is taking place. It's spirited. The issues, you know, we're, we're dealing with frontier issues, no, but drafters draft in accord with, with instructions and their understanding of the policy. So it's not an attack on the drafters. It's, it's not mm -hmm. just a number of things are coming up, are coming up. So when the CPC in, in, in helping to respond say, let us read and read the provisions carefully also, because sometimes things are written there, but we read them differently. And there are other times we're reading what is there, thinking that what we meant is actually reflected there. So the takeaway is that we will go back and we will look to see that what, what we are refining as the policy intent behind each provision, behind the entire law, that those are accurately reflected in the words that okay, we all right. Thanks. Certainly, yeah, yeah. No, no dispute, no dispute there. So, right. so in closing, on the issue that has led to the greatest um, interpretive th 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 difference, what I would suggest is that we, uh, we agree up to the, a certain point on the, on the authority. We agree that the bill says may, that, the, that all of these attributes may be required. We agree that an, the authority has a discretion to require um, some or all of these attributes where there is an interpretive disagreement, at least between in this discussion, is the degree to which that discretion is appropriately constrained to prevent the concerns that we have articulated in, the, in, the, in, 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 in our submission. We would appreciate if greater clarity could be just extended in constraining that discretion, because it is in the use of that discretion that the entire menu, as you put it, could be mandated in a variety of circumstances changing over time so we would appreciate point, point it point okay, thank, you, thank you very, thank you thank you very, very much, you. much all right thank you. thank you very much everybody yeah, and i wish you all the best in your life going to adjourn in another two minutes just to ask grace and marissa please can you as soon as possible send the list just the list because you have circulated already all the written response written written contributions and the responses to the written contributions to ensure that all members of the Joint Select Committee are aware of all the written submissions. There are over 103. But just send the list again for me, please, Grace and Morrison. We're not going to meet next week, members of the Joint Select Committee, which would give members the opportunity to go over many of these um, presentations and also the responses to the presentations. But in the week of April the 19th, I would certainly want to start setting some dates where we can start to consider the bill so that a report can be tabled in Parliament towards the end of April, early May, so that Parliament, we can report to Parliament no later, hopefully, than May. So please, Grayson, just send, try to put all the minutes up to date and also to remind members of all the written submissions that came in 
and the responses. So Jamaica to Justice, I want to thank you for the tremendous amount of time you put into examining the bill. You certainly have caused a number of reflections and many of the points you raised will assist us as we deliberate on the bill. So thanks again. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, also, members of the thanks for having us. Not only to Jamaica for Justice, but also to all the other contributors. Okay, so thanks again. And can I have a motion for adjournment? From oh, the... so moved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks again. We will be in touch with all the members of the Joint Select Committee during the course of the, not next week, but the following week. Thank you very much, everyone.